It's 9.46. Namaste. A very warm welcome to all our participants who have joined from different parts of the Asia Pacific region and also to the speakers for this training on gender equality and human rights. This three-day training program, which is online, is being co-organized by the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, what we commonly is known as Arrow and CNS, to help media and gender justice advocates strengthen their engagement around gender equality and human rights in the Asia Pacific region. We are very fortunate to have with us a galaxy of very eminent faculty and resource persons to kickstart the first day of this training. Their inputs will help increase the knowledge, our knowledge rather, about the various global treaties and conventions that our countries have promised to implement to achieve gender justice. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements before we begin. Participants, please. Participants, please mute, your, mute yourself while the speakers present. There will be a question and answer session, open session after the presentation of each speaker. Please type in your questions and comments in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak to ask your question. We need your support to make this session as interactive as possible. So please do not hesitate to clarify your doubts and share your comments and queries. Also, one last request. We are living in difficult times and many of us are still working from home. I am. So please pardon and bear with any technical glitches beyond our control that might arise due to poor internet connectivity. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm indeed honored to welcome and invite Sivananti Thanantiran. Executive Director of Arrow for her opening remarks and for the virtual launch of Arrow's media training manual on gender equality for the Asia Pacific region. As we all know, Siva is a committed activist and leader for social and gender justice. And she strongly believes that the new normal needs to be feminist. We are all with you Siva on that. Under her leadership, Arrow has expanded its work to include the intersections of sexual and reproductive rights and critical development issues such as climate change, migration, and disabilities. Over to you, Siva. Thank you, Shobha. I hope you can clear, hear me clearly. Yes, very clearly. Great. Uh, firstly, let me thank the CNS team uh, who has been really amazing and putting together this uh, wonderful manual, which I believe that uh, Bobby and uh, Shobha will like show later, um, you know, which is a very thorough, it's a very comprehensive manual. Um, I wanted to uh, thank them for their hard work in bringing everyone together today as well. And thank you all for joining us. I know that uh, digitalization has made it more accessible for many to join, but we are also mindful that, you know, it has been a hard year for all of us, as Shobha said, uh, a hard two years. Uh, many of us have lost those who are dear to us. Uh, many of us have seen those who are uh, who felt sick and had to do caregiving jobs around us. So it has been uh, difficult on so many different counts. And thank you for making the time over these next three days in order to join us. So what we have seen during this time of two years has actually shown us that burdens uh, at the household and individual levels have shifted so significantly. Right, uh, government was not able to handle uh, all of the full effects of the COVID crisis, whether it was the health crisis, and now what we can see an economic and social crisis that is taking place at country level. Uh, we can already witness uh, around us, right, uh, either um, more households and more families uh, falling into poverty or facing economic constraints. In that the gender dimension is really amplified. So we can see uh, girls dropping out of school, children dropping out of school in order to support their families. 
uh, we can see uh, rising uh, numbers of uh, families who are forced to do child early and forced marriage in order to kind of uh, shift, you know, uh, the economic burden away from families. Um, at the same time, we saw health services being completely um, taken up by having to handle COVID, right? And in having to handle COVID, what has happened is that uh, critical services, whether they were antenatal services, maternal health services, family planning services, uh, young people's services, adolescent and sexual reproductive health services, all of this were kind of deemed as unnecessary. But Following that was, of course, you know, uh, unintended pregnancy, uh, rise in maternal mortality, and especially even during COVID-19, only I think in this year, did even in Malaysia, which already has a rather extensive health service, did we even see that a rise number of maternal deaths because women uh, who had contracted COVID were exceptionally vulnerable uh, in the care that they needed to give and the health system was not able to extend that care to them. Um, at the same time, we are living in a, in a time where there's been great constraints on the free press, right? Uh, we can see that uh, across country, uh, due to this pandemic, either emergency measures have been put in place or in a number of countries that a lot of, um, I, I guess, uh, constraints on the free press according to what can be covered, what can be said and what cannot be said. Uh, free press and the media is, of course, you know, a fundamental pillar of democracy. Uh, and this is really important that uh, the media is able to report on these issues of gender inequality, uh, is able to, or social inequality that is taking place at country level. Um, and this is something that we need to keep in mind. The other thing that has emerged with digitalization over the last uh, decade or so was the fact that media was no longer just about press and television, right? Uh, all of us are in one way a media producer because we have access to social media. And that is why I'm really pleased that, you know, CNS has also called uh, those who consider themselves uh, uh, activists, a social activists to enter into the scene because you are also producers of media. You do it through the work that you do, um, either in your outreach to communities themselves, or they are also something that uh, you also produce media either on your social media websites uh, of your organization of your own self. So I think in this, it's really useful to keep in mind the real necessity of bringing up the issue of gender equality within all of the work that we do and applying that lens. So I really welcome all of you willing to spend the next three days uh, with the CNS and Aero teams, uh, as well as many of the experts who have kindly given up their time in order to be with us, uh, in order to share their insights and their knowledge with us. So over to you, Shoba. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Siva. And uh, uh, media, the, the media training manual on gender equality for Asia Pacific region, what to which Siva was referring, is live now, and the link is there in your chat box. So it's already there for all of us to see. And thank you, Arrow and Siva, once again. I now invite Galane Derisa, program specialist at UNFPA who is a storehouse of knowledge on population and development issues. She will tell us about the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, and the Nairobi Statement on ICPD 25. Welcome, Galani. Thank you so much, Shoba, and thanks to Arrow for having me here. Um, it's really a pleasure to be joining all of you um, for the start of this uh, very interesting training and very important to training. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk um, a little bit about ICPD and um, the, um, the Nairobi summit. Um, if you could maybe um, show the presentation, please. You can, you uh, can share your screen. Oh, I, I can. Okay. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, it wasn't. Yes. Yes. Allowing me to. Okay. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, 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 we can. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, so starting in the middle of the last century, population became a major concern for economic development and political stability. In 1946, the UN established the Commission on Population, um, which is what is now known as the Commission on Population and Development, um, which some of you may be familiar with. At the regional level, the Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East, ECAFE, which is ESCAP's predecessor, also had a focus on population, including through the establishment of the Asian Population Conference in 1962, and which has been held every decade since then. It was concerned that population pressure driven by high levels of fertility in developing countries was too great and would lead to population growth, resulting in mass starvation and death, as well as political unrest. This concern was enough that some experts were um, really ringing the alarm bells, as you can see in the title of this um, book, The Population Bomb. The so solution was, uh, that was proposed was that population growth needed to be limited. In Asia, population programs were launched in order to ensure economic growth and stability. And these programs, largely had, with, had a, an intention to control population growth, often using coercive measures. In 1994, the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, was convened in Cairo, at which a program of action was adopted by 179 member states. The program of action redefined population programs with a focus on human rights, gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, placing people at the center of any efforts towards population and development. So this was a significant shift. At the core of ICPD is a simple concept that people, individuals and couples have the right to determine whether, when, and how often to have children. In other words, choice at the center of fertility. It also called for access to the necessary information and means to control their fertility and make informed choices. Underpinning rights related to fertility is gender equality. So two concepts that are really important, choice and gender equality. And that this choice, the heart of reproductive rights is central to population and development and more broadly to sustainable development. In this way, sexual and reproductive right, health and rights were recognized as essential not only for human dignity, but also for physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being. So here you see a little bit of the evolution of the ICPD. The program of action started with actually the International Conference on Human Rights, which was held in 1968 in Tehran at which the basic rights of parents to determine freely and responsibly the number and the spacing of their children was agreed upon. Starting in 1974, UN population conferences were organized every decade, the first one in 1974, but also subsequent conferences in 1984 and 1994. CEDAW, which guarantees women equal rights in, in relation to reproductive rights, to decide freely and responsibly on the number and spacing of their children and to have access to the information, education, and means to enable them to exercise these rights. So not just the right to make the decision, but also to have the means and um, information that they need to be able to exercise the rights, as well as included in the right to education, um, women's right to education, access to specific educational information to help ensure the health and well-being of families, including advice on family planning. So the concept which was agreed in Tehran in 1968 was taken forward and became part of human rights law in CEDAW in 1979. So this is really an important step in the path to the ICPD in 1994. So in 1994, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights became the basis for redefining population programs language and concepts that were then taken forward in the Beijing Platform for Action as core elements of gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Oh, and let me just go back. And you'll see in the upper left-hand corner that there is an orange book, the program of action. So this is what, um, what it actually encompasses the entire program of action. And 
working on issues related to population, but especially sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, as well as gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, this is a really important uh, document. The process for the ICPD began in 1989 with the General Assembly Resolution, and preparation for the conference took nearly four years, including for extensive consultations on the language of the program of action, which happened at national level, at regional level, and at global level. And keep in mind that this agreement is, was a negotiated agreement, so every word in it was, a nego was negotiated. Participants at the conference included member states, family planning program implementers, religious organizations, environmental organizations, and women's organizations. And here I want to flag that women's organizations really played a very critical role. Wherever it was possible, they were incorporated into national delegations. But even beyond national delegations, women's organizations played a really critical role in advocating for strong language on sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. It was really largely due to the role of women's organizations and gender equality advocates that the landmark program of action was adopted. The process and outcomes um, were really important as a demonstration of political commitment and intent to take action to prioritize sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights as a central component of, of sustainable development. Well, the ICPD program of action at its core is really about how people's rights to decide on issues related to their fertility, ensuring gender equality and empowering women and girls are at the center of managing population dynamics. The agenda is really broad. It makes a case for placing people at the center of all development efforts, including those related to poverty and economic development, environment, urbanization and migration, health, as the path towards balanced, sustainable development. ICPD's path, um, ICPD's vision of placing people at the center of the pathway to sustainable development in a way was a precursor to Agenda 2030, including in relation to tackling inequality, empowering women and girls, unleashing human capacity, and ensuring that no one is left behind. So while there is much overlap between Agenda 2030 and ICPD, what we found in the ICPD at 25 review, which took place in 2018 at the regional level and 2019 at the global level, is that ICPD is as relevant today as it was in 1994. And there is a need for continued focus on ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. The Nairobi summit was a high level conference organized to mobilize political will and financial commitments for full implementation of the ICPD program of action. It was a multi-stakeholder meeting which brought together over 8,000 people from 172 countries. And it was a, a really a diverse group of people, uh, governments, parliamentarians, thought leaders, technical experts, civil society, grassroots organizations, youth organizations, and then young people, uh, indigenous people, people with disabilities, as well as business and community leaders um, and international financial institutions, as well as others that, are, that have an interest in advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights. The summit took an integrated approach covering five themes and highlighting the power of gender equality, youth leadership, political and community leadership, and innovation and data and partnerships in order to accelerate progress. So these were seen as accelerators. The five themes were related to sexual and reproductive health and rights as a part of universal health coverage. So within that, a strong focus on ending preventable maternal deaths and ending unmet need for family planning. Financing for ICPD, so looking both at domestic and international financing for SRHR. Um, and there were significant commitments, financial commitments made by donor countries um, and uh, approximately $8 billion in new pledges um, announced looking at um, preventable maternal, ending preventable maternal deaths and ending unmet need for family planning and ending gender-based violence um, and harmful practices by 2030. Another theme on ensuring that SRH services are provided even in humanitarian and fragile contexts 
noting the, the in extreme importance that basic humanitarian needs and rights of affected populations, particularly that of women, girls and women, are addressed as critical components of responses to humanitarian and environmental crises, as well as in fragile and post-crisis reconstruction contexts. And then ending gender-based violence and harmful practices, as well as drawing on demographic diversity for sustainable development. So these were really the themes around which the Nairobi summit was organized. Our world has in many ways profoundly changed over the last 25 years and many new issues are influencing the field of population and development, including climate change, growing inequalities and exclusion within and between countries, migration, the youth bulge, and the prospects of demographic dividends, as well as increasing demographic diversity. Siva touched on many of these issues in her opening. The Nairobi summit galvanized a new generation of advocates to take forward the ICPD program of action. And the Nairobi statement focused on the theme areas of the conference, but also had a few additional elements that I would like to emphasize. One, the need to invest in young people and a commitment to not discuss and decide on issues related to young people without their meaningful involvement and participation. The importance of peaceful, just, and inclusive societies without discrimination on any grounds, including sexual orientation and gender identity or expression, and the need for quality, timely, and disaggregated data. At Nairobi, there was also an opportunity for stakeholders to make commitments. From Asia Pacific, there were commitments by 29 governments, as well as CSOs and youth organizations and networks, including at the regional level. A high-level commission on Nairobi Summit follow-up was established, which just launched its first annual progress report uh, on the second anniversary of the Nairobi Summit. The report stresses that progress has been made on some Nairobi commitments, even among the devastating fallout of the, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, however, the pandemic has also laid bare the glaring inequalities of people who face intersecting forms of discrimination based on gender, race, age, disability, poverty, and status as a migrant refugee. And overall, governments and the international community have fallen short in meeting their commitments to the full achievement of the ICPD program of action. This has been evident in eroding services, lost financing and diminishing political accountability for sexual and reproductive health and rights. Amid continued evidence of the denial of sexual and reproductive rights, the commission calls for a global agenda for sexual and reproductive justice that requires deliberately overcoming all barriers to realize rights and achieving bodily autonomy. The commission emphasizes that this depends on specific tailored and prioritized interventions for individuals and groups especially those facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. So this is a little bit of an overview of both the ICPD program of action, how it came about, as well as how it's being taken forward in the commitments that were made at the Nairobi summit in 2019. So I'd like to stop here, thank you, and um, so that we can have um, some time for questions and, and discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Galane, for sharing so much information in so little a time. Very well put. Now we open for the question and answer and session and the open session. And participants, please type in your questions, comments, doubts, or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak. So we are waiting for, the, for them. And uh, there is a question, Galane, that why are countries failing to uphold commitments made for ICPD? And then also the Nairobi uh, statement. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's that's um, a good question. It's also, I think, quite a complicated question to answer. I don't know that there's necessarily any one reason, but I think, um, you know, part of, the struggle that we see um, at UNFPA when we're working with governments is that there are many demands in terms of what governments need to address. So I think 
Um, the one thing that is, I, I think, really important, and, and I say this because it is, you know, someone working to advance ICPD and, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, is that it's really important that we make every effort and find ways to, um, to see the intersections between sexual and reproductive health and rights and other areas. And I think here I would like to really commend the work that Arrow has done on highlighting a lot of these interconnections. I think that's really important and it's essential um, that we're able to be presenting the importance of these issues, not just within, for example, health discussions, but in any sustainable development discussion. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the second part of my answer would be that I think, you know, one of the things that we're observing is that um, the environment in which we're operating in is one of increasing pushback against human rights, decreasing space for civil engagement and civil society. And those trends certainly have an impact on all of the efforts that are made towards advancing gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, as well as sexual and reproductive health and rights. So it's, uh, you know, we're moving into an environment where we see in many countries, it's more conservative and the space to advance the issues is less. And even where, um, you know, policies are still in place, the policies alone aren't enough. Uh, we need to see that they are fully finance, that there's budgeting for, um, for uh, implementation of the policies, as well as addressing other um, bottlenecks to implementation of policies, including, for example, uh, social norms that are um, harmful. Uh, thank you. There is a question from Irfan Ali Koker that what impact will global warming have on the migration of the population? Um, well, I think that, you know, what we see is that um, with climate change, there is an increase in population migration. And I think that that's, you know, rising sea levels is, um, of, you know, a, a really big concern for the region, especially in the Pacific, but also in other areas. There are many, um, when you look at the, the uh, you know, populations that are living in um, low um, in areas that are, you know, close to sea level, it will definitely have um, a significant impact. And that's just looking at rising sea level. It's not looking at the increasing, um, increasing natural disasters that are climate induced, which is also having a huge impact on, on many people across the region. Uh, uh, thank you, Vilanesa. Uh, Salil Tandon wants to know, what has been different between the ICPD, MDGs, and SDGs? If they are very similar and overlapping, why did we feel the need to develop new frameworks and agendas? Okay, thanks. Um, I think that they are, you know, they are similar. They're not exactly the same. So um, perhaps I can answer this question in, you know, looking at, if you look at ICPD, program of action and you look at agenda 2030 and to look at agenda 2030 maybe using the SDGs because that's the easiest way to kind of um, capture it I think you'll see that ICPD cuts across pretty much all of the 17 uh, goals of the SDGs not everything that's in ICPD is in the SDGs and not everything that's in the SDGs is in ICPD but there is overlap um, in a way, it's, I think, a different, you know, it's different frames for looking at issues. From my perspective, I think the importance of ICPD and why, you know, it, it's still relevant and why we see that governments feel that it's still relevant is that it allows us to look at sustainable development starting at the level of individual starting at the, the, the point of human rights. And I think that's really important. And I think one of the things that we see, you know, when you go into these large international conferences that are, that have negotiated outcomes, um, it's, um, you have views from, every, you know, all 
different sectors coming in and all different elements of you know, the societies and countries around the world. And so the framing of, of, um, of these agreements changes depending on what the specific focus is. But ICPD and Agenda 2030 definitely are interlinked. They are not entirely the same. And that's why the continued emphasis on ICPD through its reviews, but also through the various advocacy efforts that are made is really critical because this, um, you know, the idea of having reproductive rights, gender equality, and the empowerment of women really at the center of efforts for sustainable development is critical. Um, it's really critical. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vilasini, uh, Vilasini Vijendran wants to know, how can we hold governments accountable towards their commitments under ICPD as promised? And uh, Edna Paz has a similar question that what about sanctions for those to, who do not comply? Um, well, I, I think um, in terms of accountability, I mean, I think one thing is um, that you can do is, you know, if you look at what governments have committed to in the ICPD, you can look at where there are gaps, um, you can look at progress reports, and, and use that to hold governments accountable. Um, so, you know, through advocacy, working with parliamentarians, I think that's, you know, often a really critical piece to make sure that it's not just, so I think in this region, we've seen many governments have a lot of policies related to ICPD. It's implementation where there's, you know, um, maybe less progress and also financing. So looking at those two specific issues, I think is really important. There are typically ICPD reviews every five years. So getting engaged in the national process around the ICPD review is really um, one opportunity. And then, you know, many governments, as I mentioned, made commitments at the Nairobi summit. So looking at those commitments and, um, you know, helping to monitor them and hold the government accountable for those commitments is another, uh, another opportunity, as well as where they've made commitments in um, you know, in other fora. So for example, a number of countries have made commitments through Family Planning 2020, holding them accountable for those commitments, as well as following what they're doing in terms of reporting um, into human rights, um, in relation to human rights. So for CEDAW, but also for the Universal Periodic Review, the UPR. So looking at what they're reporting um, and holding them accountable for the things that they, the recommendations related to, um, to UPR, for example, that they've agreed to, making sure that they're actually following up and implementing those recommendations. Thank you. I would request the participants also, you can raise your virtual hand if you really want to speak out your question on comment. Uh, meanwhile, Abhiti Gupta wants to know how is ICPD including the voices of young people? And what kind of initiatives have taken place for that? Yeah, that's a really um, good question. I mean, I think uh, what we saw at the Nairobi summit actually was that there was a huge number of young people who were engaged, both in the preparations, but also at the summit. And I think a lot of those efforts have continued. Um, and it's, you know, the point in the Nairobi statement that there is, there should be no discussion on young people without their involvement, um, meaningful involvement and participation is really, really critical. Um, so engaging youth organizations, youth networks is something that's essential and, you know, um, something that actually all all proponents of SRHR should be advocating for. And so, for example, in the review processes of ICPD, um, we one of the things that we do as UNFP is we really try to make sure that there is space for young people's organizations and networks to engage in the process um, specifically. Uh, thank you for that. Then we have another question uh, from uh, Omang Setinaike, 
that in our current context with the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the global economy, uh, it is important to consider if governments will actually be able to reach out to these commitments and how can this challenge be overcome? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously COVID has created a huge, um, a huge challenge um, for, for at every level of society. So uh, that's noted and the expectation, you know, that of course affects all sectors. But what I would say within that is that it's really essential that we make sure that the needs of women and girls don't, don't get um, pushed to the side. And that is really critical in relation to maternal health. So one of the things Siva was talking about is the impact of COVID on maternal deaths. Um, it's about access to um, to family planning and contraceptives and being able to control their fertility. But it's also in relation to uh, gender-based violence and being, you know, being ensuring that women and girls are, um, are safe even when they're at home and that these are really priorities. And so I think it's, you know, it's essential to make, to continue to make the links that this is a piece of ensuring, it's a piece of the COVID response. Uh, another question is that how can we accelerate implementing ICPD and have we really gone back in some countries of the Asia Pacific region, particularly due to the Asia Pacific region, yes, particularly due to COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have seen that there has been backsliding. And I mean, I, what I would say is that's, you know, it's not unique to, um, to ICPD. Uh, there's been backsliding in a number of areas. And part of it is in relation to COVID. I think that there is, when you look specifically at um, SRHR and gender equality, there was already some backsliding in parts of this region anyway. And so, I mean, the, the need to, to fully implement ICPD is still there. There is a huge amount of unfinished business, despite the progress that's been made since 1994. In terms of accelerating, I mean, I think that we need to, um, you know, there, there are a number of things, and I don't think that there's one um, easy answer to how we best accelerate in all contexts across all areas of ICPD. But I do think that it's really important for us um, to make sure that we're focusing very much um, on, um, on innovation. So looking at how we can do things better where we're not doing them well enough. Um, looking at um, strengthening partnerships, because I think it's really clear that where we've made the most success, it's, you know, strong partnerships are essential and that that's something that we need to, to take forward. I would say that also, I think, you know, working with young people is really critical because I think that's also um, how, you know, it's essential to how we build in the perspective of ICPD um, as we move forward. But, uh, you know, and then we need to just do, you know, continuously monitor and evaluate and reassess and revise our strategies. Um, and for that, you know, access to, to accurate, reliable, timely data that's disaggregated is really critical. Uh, Dr. Shamima Parveen uh, from Pathfinder International Bangladesh wants to know, what measures could be taken for gender e equality in the marginalized groups of people? Well, I think, I mean, that, um, I don't know that I have a, a, a specific answer to that. It probably, I mean, I think that there is a lot of um, effort that needs to be done um, across all communities, but. Uh, a lot of effort that needs to be done in terms of looking at changing harmful social norms. So, um, and, and that actually to do that, I mean, you know, one thing is, you know, working through media and making sure that media 
doesn't reinforce harmful social norms. But then I think there's a, you know, the, the big piece of the work is really at the community level um, and working with communities um, to change um, social norms. And I think that's probably, I mean, what will bring about the most lasting and sustainable change. And for that, you know, it really needs to be um, done in a way that um, is taking into consideration the specific context and um, realities of that um, specific community. Uh, thank you. Kalyani Thapa wants to know what could be the role of ICPD in regions where abortion is still a stigma and is not legal, legalized also? Well, I think that um, for um, when it comes to abortion, I mean, ICPD uh, recognizes that there are, um, it, it doesn't make a specific recommendation on, um, on policies for safe abortion. It does um, specifically indicate that where, that the services need to be provided um, when an unsafe, uh, when a woman has undergone gone an unsafe abortion. What I would say for um, activists and, and those working on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is that, um, you know, I think within reproductive rights, I think that there is, you know, there, you can use reproductive rights and some of the, and actually here I would recommend that you actually go through some of the general recommendations um, that have come out. Um, where, you know, there is stronger language in relation to looking at the, the link between um, uh, or the importance of access to abortion to reduce, um, to reduce uh, unintended pregnancies and also um, poor maternal health outcomes. So I think that there's, you know, you can draw on the human rights language um, related to reproductive rights. So, I mean, CEDAW is a starting point, but there that has evolved, um, as well as the concepts within ICPD to look at how best to address um, uh, reducing maternal deaths and, you know, looking at um, doing analysis of the maternal deaths um, related and access to family planning and lack of access to abortion. I mean, I think that that's one way that you can um, you can use ICPD in looking at access to abortion. ICPD itself does not specifically indicate that countries or mandate that countries should provide safe abortion. And one last question for you, Galani, uh, from Kevin Tran. Uh, how well ICPD and CRPD work to bring inclusive and universal access for the disabled people across the yeah, region? That, yeah, that's a really um, important question. Um, it's, uh, you know, in ICPD, um, it, it's included, but it's not, I, I, what I would say is it's not, it wasn't explicit and um, as explicit as it would have been probably if it were passed today, though, I, having said that, I don't think, I, see, I think we would find it very challenging to get ICPD adopted right now. But it is really um, a hugely important area. And actually what I would want, what I want to say, I mean, this is, applies beyond um, issues related to people with disabilities, but I think it's important to note that ICPD, while what was adopted in 1994 is still relevant, the world has also shifted in our understanding of priorities has also evolved in relation to the context. So while what was adopted in 1994 is really critical and it's still relevant and we don't want to lose that, we also want to see that the, the way that we implement ICPD has evolved and it has. And so addressing the needs of um, the SRHR needs of people with disabilities is really critical and is um, is something that um, needs to be factored in. And actually, it is something that is um, has been incorporated at the regional level in um, the make the right um, make 
what does it make, make the right wheel, the regional, the Inchon strategy, the regional strategy um, on, um, on people with disabilities, it's actually sexual and reproductive health and rights is incorporated in that. And so one of the things that we're, you know, we look at at the regional level is how these two agendas, um, thank you, making the right wheel, how these two agendas intersect. Um, and so it, it is a really critical component of taking forward the ICPD program of action. Okay, thank you, Galane, thank you very much for these such valuable and informative inputs. And uh, now we will hear from Doreen Whitner about CEDAW, the UN Convention for Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Doreen is Program Specialist at UN Women for the Asia Pacific region. Over to you, Doreen. Thank you so much. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, please do. Okay, good. And I hope I'll manage. Yes. Okay, um, that's the wrong slide. I started the okay. back. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. It is a great pleasure. Um, I hope I can shine a little bit of light on CEDAW. Um, many, many people already are quite familiar with CEDAW. So if you feel this is too basic, if you feel I'm not giving you enough information or the wrong information, please put it in the chat and feel free to interrupt me at any point. I have a strong ego, I can handle it. Um, so let's have a look. Um, so CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination is of course the Bill of Rights for Women Globally. <clears throat> it was adopted long, long time ago in 1979 and came into force in 1981. Today, uh, 189 countries are, have ratified the convention. There are only five or six countries left, including the United States, Palau and Somalia. Um, who have not ratified. The only convention that has more ratification is the rights of the children. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about CEDA, we talk about very specific rights that are captured in the convention. We have altogether 30 articles, but uh, only 16 of them are actually addressing the core. We have article one to four, when we talk about the general framework, what is discrimination and what is not. For example, temporary special measures is considered positive discrimination. So if we have um, a discriminatory um, section in the law, or if we have an imbalance in certain rights to enforce positive discrimination, to enact temporary special measures is not considered discrimination, but just even out the um, uh, injustice that had happened in the past. Um, when we talk about CEDAW Article 5, we talk about discrimination and cultural practices. That is really important. A lot of countries actually put reservation on it, um, but the CEDAW committee is very clear. If a cultural practice discriminates against women, it is not an excuse. Cultural practices are not an excuse for discrimination. For example, in some countries, women don't have the right to divorce based on culture. This is not okay. This is still something that the CEDAW committee will bring up. Um, Article six deals with sexual exploitation. This is quite important. Here we talk about human trafficking and that women shouldn't be criminalized, but we also talk about women and prostitution or women sex workers. And here, this is really interesting. Um, the committee doesn't give ask uh, a specific um, recommendation how to address it. Many countries have found different solution or uh, addressing the problem in a different way. For example, in Sweden, it was one of the first country where they actually uh, criminalized the buyer. Um, so the man who um, goes and, and purchase <laughs> the sex worker, um, or um, other, in other countries, um, prostitution or sex work was legalized altogether. Um, it has certain back drawers. I remember specifically, I am from Germany. We, um, we legalized prostitution in 2006, but didn't uh, put proper regulations in place 
So actually trafficking and sexual exploitation of minors increased. So everybody kind of has to figure out how to do it and find the best way for their country to deal with it. The CEDAW committee is just clear, avoid sexual exploitation, give uh, opportunities to women so that they don't have to engage. And if they engage, they are safe to do so. Um, Article 7 talks about political and public right. Here we have the right to vote, to hold public offices. And here it comes also in the temporary special measures quota for women and also how to empower women and the political environment to have a level playing field. Most of you know that um, the sweet spot for real participation is 30%. Only when women have 30% power or uh, seats within, within the national parliament or in decision making, can they make a real difference? Um, Article 8, participation at international level, there we talk about representation as diplomats or representation of the government at the different, uh, at an international level. Right to nationality. This is really important because often a woman, uh, once she marries a foreigner, she loses her nationality and she also does the, the opportunity to pass her nationality to her children, which can create problem if a divorce or one of the um, people dies. Um, equal right to education. And that is actually a really interesting article because when you look at the global statistics, girls by now do better in education than boys do. Um, they have better levels and so on, but it's still a traditional, um, it is still traditional if there are lack of resources that the boys will be sent to school. And often, unfortunately, higher education or higher grades in education doesn't translate into better employment opportunities for women. Here we come into Article 11, specifically on employment. There we talk about uh, maternity leave. We talk about uh, protection from se sexual harassment. We talk about um, lifting limitations, for example, that women are not allowed to work at night and so on and so forth. And of course, really important, equal pay for equal work. Um, Article 12 is on healthcare and family planning. I just listened to you on the debate about abortion. Um, CEDA is, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say as outspoken as I would like it to be, but at least what they have and one of their general recommendation is that they encourage the government when possible um, to lift uh, criminalization of abortion and that they would draw punishment for the woman who engage in abortion and for the practitioner who performs the abortion. So that is as strong language as you get from CEDA. Um, Article 13 looks at economic rights, land rights, um, right to loan without having to ask your husband to sign off on it and so on. Rural women, I think it's quite clear, especially in rural areas or in the Pacific and outer islands, women often do not have as many opportunities for employment, um, for, for education, often not much uh, access to legal systems either. So there it's really to make sure that rural women enjoy the same rights as other women in, in urban areas. Article 15 is about equality before the law. This is actually my absolute favorite. And I will come back to it because at the end, if we can't enforce any legislation, any laws, um, then CEDA is just a piece of paper and our national legislation as well. So equality before the law is pretty much the heart to make um, CEDA and national uh, rights enforceable. Article 16 goes into marriage and family. And here we talk about uh, prohibition of child marriage. We talk about equal rights to divorce. We talk about uh, inheritance rights and so on. So this is the core of CEDA. And these are the rights that if a country ratifies, um, they sign up to progressively implement. Often where, implementing legislation is a, a question of resources but of course that shouldn't prevent the government from actually enforcing it but they might have to do it step by step 
And there we come um, to, to the CEDAW reporting cycle where I will go into in a little bit. So you will have noticed the core, um, the core of CEDAW um, provides a number of rights, but there are also a lot of rights missing. First, keep in mind when the convention was drafted um, so long ago, um, first of all, it was a debate uh, between the women's movement for almost 10 years. And then a lot of issues have come up over the last 30 plus years that the CEDA, uh, that the CEDA uh, committee or the CEDA, um, yeah, the people who are responsible for drafting weren't aware yet. So over the time, the CEDA committee issued um, general recommendations, um, 38 at this point. Um, but we have to note the general recommendations are not legally binding. When a country ratifies, they are obliged to actually look at the core articles of CEDAW. But when it comes to general recommendation, it is more considered a guideline to consider these things in the CEDAW reporting and implementation as well. For example, we have um, general recommendation 14 about female genital mutilation. Um, we also have a general recommendation specifically for women living with disability. And I've listened to your uh, conversation earlier, and I think um, what could be clear in all the conventions and, and in all the uh, policies that are adopted is a clearer line uh, between physical disability and psychosocial or learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities because often women are all uh, with disabilities are all put in one pot and then one solution um, is proposed that doesn't really fit all the women that have different forms of disability. Um, unfortunately, um, most of the convention are not very strong on that. Um, we have, of course, um, ending violence against women. There we have general recommendation 19 and 35. 35 was just recently issued and builds on general recommendation 19. It's actually really quite comprehensive how to deal with violence against women in specific countries. Mm, general recommendation 27 is specifically on protection of older women a field that is often overlooked. In many countries, um, age-related poverty is a real problem. And given that women often live longer than men and have less um, employment opportunities, more responsibility for children, a lot of women actually slip into poverty when they come at an older, comes to an older stage, age. Um, general recommendation 30 is on women, peace and security, where we look at women's participation in uh, conflict resolution and, um, and participating in peace building and so on and so forth. Um, we have one rather strong general recommendation mm -hmm. of women's access to justice. And the recent one that was just issued a few months ago is trafficking in the context of global migration. So we do have quite a big package of what is considered the CEDAW convention as a whole and what countries have to consider when they look at their own CEDAW reporting and implementation. Um, just really briefly on the CEDAW optional protocol because it's often mistaken as a part of CEDAW. CEDAW uh, optional protocol is a specific treaty. Um, it, is, it needs to be ratified separately um, and it enables the CEDAW committee to receive complaints and actually look into specific human rights violation within a country. Um, this only women uh, groups or individual women can claim their rights through the CEDAW committee only if they exhausted all national remedies. Only when they went through their system in the country and they didn't get their rights, then they can uh, use the complaint or the communication procedure uh, with CEDA. A lot of laws actually have been amended through this communication um, where women, for example, with domestic violence, the, the law wasn't properly enforced, women died, women's group took this to CEDA and the CEDA committee approached the government directly to ask them for new legislation and that did happen. So it can be a quite powerful tool that can be used by, especially by CSOs to push for something at an international level. 
We also have an inquiry procedure where there is systematic and grave abuse of women's rights. The CEDO committee can go in and inquire and actually provide uh, recommendations there as well. So who is the mysterious CEDO committee? Uh, I've talked about them quite a little bit. Um, so there are 23 experts uh, on different fields. Some of them are more into family law, others are specifically on economic rights for women. <clears throat> They are independent, so they don't have to um, represent their countries. They're independent experts when they do their procedures. Um, they are, however, recommended by their government. Um, they have a four year term and uh, the CEDO committee meets, looks at the CEDO reports from the government and has the constructive dialogues with government and civil society organizations. Um, I think it used to be three sessions per year, but the treaty bodies have, I think, financial issues, not enough funding, so I think it was reduced to two, but um, I'm not 100% sure about that, if that's still the case. Um, so let me just really, really briefly go into the CEDAW reporting cycle. Um, this, is, this is important because often um, CEDAW is a kind of stop and go engagement by the government. Um, the government remembers after four years, oops, we have to do a CEDAW report, let's hire a consultant to draft it and then be done with it. That's not how it should be. Um, the CEDAW reporting cycle should be that a government drafts a report, most uh, the, the ideal would be that the ministries, the different ministries, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Finance, <laughs> Ministry of Women come together and jointly draft a report that reflects the human rights situation of women in their country. They then submit it to the CEDAW committee and the CEDAW committee can look at it and issue the question. This is also when the shadow reporting comes in. The shadow reporting is the opportunity for civil society organizations to engage with the CEDAW committee. The shadow report is a reaction to the state report and shows the women's rights situation from a civil society point of view. Often when you read the um, state report and the shadow report, you would think you're in two different countries because the perception of government and civil society on where women rights are in a specific country are often quite different. So once the CEDAW committee reviews the um, report and the issues that they were pre-sent to the government and they were addressed, then we have the constructive dialogue. We have a delegation from the specific country coming to Geneva and engage in a one-day dialogue with um, with the, with the CEDAW committee, with the 23 CEDAW committee members. I've attended that a number of times and it can be quite tough, um, tough engagement. The CEDAW committee doesn't hold back with their questions and often um, new ideas are drawn out and, and uh, human rights violations are discussed in quite detailed, in a detailed way. Um, Again, here the civil society has the opportunity to engage with the CEDAW committee as well. There are site events um, where the CEDAW uh, where CSOs can invite CEDAW committee members to give their perception, to provide their uh, view of what's happening in the country. And that is taken in by the, um, by the CEDAW committee and then brought back to the government or actually issued in the so-called uh, concluding observations. The concluding observations are based on the shadow report, on the state report, on individual reports, um, and on the constructive dialogue, and gives the government around about 30 to 40 recommendation what should be done uh, within the country to advance women's rights. Um, since a few years, um, there are now always the so-called follow-up concluding observations. There are two to three um, most pressing uh, women's human rights violations in the country that the CEDAW committee asked the state to address within two years, not within four years, like the normal CEDAW reporting cycle, but within two years. Um, so then the government should go home, sit with the civil society. Again, that's the ideal, what should be. Most of the time it doesn't happen, but what should happen. The, CEDAW uh, the, the government sits with the civil society organization, looks at the concluding observations and makes a plan 
how to implement concluding observations within the next four years. Um, as I said, often that's not the case. The concluding observations are received. Everybody gets upset about them. They put in a drawer and then in four years, they've been looked at it. But they're here, the civil society actually, and the uh, United Nations as well, it's also our job, um, we should push. We always should use the CEDAW concluding observation because after all, the government signed up for CEDAW, it's their obligation um, to now actually use this kind of cycle to make it happen and to advance women's rights. So let me come back to equality before the law. Um, when we look at um, the CEDAW general recommendations that we often have, um, it focuses very much on legislative change, on training judges, on um, doing more in, in the area of um, services, shelter, and so on and so forth. And that is super important. But when we have a look at the statistics at this point, uh, meaningful justice is not available for most of the people. And what I'm writing here, over 5 billion people do not have meaningful access to justice. This is not a typo, that is indeed 5 billion. There was the first global report that was issued in 2019, and they had a look at um, the justice that is available for all people. And that is the figure that they came up with. Um, about half of those people, the 5 billion, are women. They have round about the same justice needs, but as you know, um, women have more barriers to cross to actually get to the justice system. On the other hand, while we have this massive justice gap, we have also a justice sector um, that is massively overwhelmed. In most of your countries, the case backlog is considerably high. It takes years to get a case through and prosecutors, police and judges are completely overwhelmed when it comes to case law. When you have a prosecutor in half, a prosecutor who has to address 500 cases, it is very unlikely that he will give, he or she will give the attention to a sexual and gender-based violence case the way it should be. On the other hand, we have only 10% of women who experience violence report to the police. So 90% don't even enter the justice system. 90% don't even claim their rights that they have on the CEDAW. When you look at uh, violence against women, it's around about 10%, only 13% of women report when they actually have a legal issue altogether. When we then finally have the woman reaching the justice system, conviction rates for sexual gender-based violence are so low. It is below 20% in most all of the countries around the world. And I'm not just talking about um, your country. For example, in my country, the general conviction rates for sexual and gender-based violence in Germany um, is by 11%. So we talk about almost 90% of offenders who get away with it. Um, on the same level, donor investment for justice has declined by 40% over the last 40 years. The problem gets bigger, the funding gets smaller, not a good balance. So what I'm saying here is if we only look at specific women's rights without looking at the bigger justice system, it is like trying to save the kitchen in a burning house. It doesn't really do much. For example, and I just use an example here that looks specifically at prosecution. And again, I use the country that is known for their um, advances in women's rights, right? So when we look at the prosecution, at the prosecution, that is where most of the cases um, are dropped when it comes to sexual and gender-based violence. On a global level, we have an attrition rate, that means what is dropped, um, by around about 40%. What I listed here with Sweden is criminal cases in general. Criminal cases, it doesn't matter if it's murder, if it's robbery, if it's bodily harm, are also dropped by 38%. So even if we have prosecutors who are trained in, in gender-based violence, if we have police officers who are gender responsive and judges, 
the problem is still there because the justice system is not working for all, not just for women. So what I'm always proposing is let's move away from justice for women to women for justice. Let's look at the bigger picture. Let's have women promote people-centered justice so we can actually move with everyone, women, men, and children, to increase justice for all. And then we definitely will increase justice for women as well. And how to do that? Um, definitely people-centered justice. We need to listen to people and need to know um, what is what women really need and not try to put them in an outdated justice system that was created 400 years ago. But on the other hand, it is also stop, not, don't just stop by engaging with CEDAW, look at the other conventions as well and bring in the gender dimension. When we talk about civil and political rights, when we talk about racial discrimination, when we talk about cultural rights, this is where the gender component needs to be brought in so that we can actually move the whole system and not just stop at the burning kitchen. And I think that's it. I hope I was clear. I'm super happy to answer questions. Um, I'm also very happy to listen to your comments and be corrected by you if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doreen. Yes, you were very clear and we have not many questions for you. <laughs> uh, first is a comment plus a question. Very informative and in-depth presentation, Doreen. Uh, is CEDAW legally binding treaty or not for all member states? And does it take primacy over trade? Kindly help us understand. Um, takes over over what? Sorry, I got didn't trade. get the trade. 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 Oh yes. wow. Okay. Um, first of all, yes, it's legally binding. Um, the who, whatever country ratifies, so one hundred eighty nine, are obliged to implement the um, the um, CEDA Convention progressively. Um, the problem here is that even though it is legally binding, not like in the national system where we have the police, in an international system, we don't have a police to actually enforce it. Um, so if a government, um, if a government don't want to, to implement certain things, there is not much for the CEDAW committee to do apart from strong recommendations. Of course, the donor community, the international community who provides funding and provides support could actually pick up on it and provide less support or shift their priorities. Um, there shouldn't be um, like, you know, it, it shouldn't be like that, that one right prevailed over the other. You can't say women rights don't prevail or prevail over trade or economic rights or cultural rights or rights for people with disability. That's not, that's not how it works. Um, unfortunately, the reality is if something has to do with economic rights, they're often favored by, by the government. And there's not much that the uh, international community can do because of state sovereignty. So that's all that I can say to it. Uh, thank you. And uh, Abhiti Gupta from India, who is working on women and queer rights issues, uh, has uh, just has an added uh, question to this one, that it is surprising that the United States has not ratified CEDAW, but it dominates the trade agenda. Can you yes. please throw some more light on it? Um, so yes, it, it, there are so many debates around that. Um, the official stand from the US is that they don't need it because they have all the women's rights um, obligation in their national um, uh, in their national legal framework already. And so they don't feel that they need to ratify. Um, they are they signed a while back, but that doesn't really mean that much. Um, so, you know, it's, it's politics um, and I'm, I'm always surprised. I mean, that the country like the United States wants to stand on the same level as Somalia, for example, when it comes to women's rights, but nobody can be forced. And um, uh, I, I don't see the United States ratifying CEDA anytime soon. Uh, 
they think they are beyond it. I, they think that they have better um, national um, uh, national frameworks in place, so they don't need CL. Okay. Uh, another question from Abhiti that is CEDA committee also eligible to give recommendations over the country level legislations. India uh, may bring stringent anti-trafficking laws, which are likely to affect the right to work for sex workers. Yes, definitely. That's actually something that the CEDA committee does quite often. Um, so there, there are actually three, three kind of avenues that can be used. First of all is the CEDA reporting. When India reports next time um, to, to the CEDA committee, um, the civil society organization should make sure that the CEDA committee knows about the law. So then they can actually issue general recommendations specifically on legislative change because it, it um, breaches women's rights. Um, the other avenue is if there is a specific example where a woman's rights was breached and she shouldn't get justice in her own country, the CEDAW uh, optional protocol can be used to claim their rights through the CEDAW committee. And on the, the third procedure, the inquiry procedure, if it's a systematic reoccurring breach in human rights, then the CEDAW committee could be triggered to actually go into the country and do their own little inquiry sort of investigation. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Carmen Zubega wants to know, can you give the difference between gender and development versus gender equality, disability and social inclusion? <laughs> is, is, there, is there a difference between that? Okay, let me, let me, let me see if I can find the, the question. Yes. So, the, yes. so gender and development. Yes. And then gender, disability and social inclusion. Yes. Yes. I don't actually I don't actually think that they're exclusive. Gender and development actually um, should just make sure that when it comes to development, that the gender specific needs are to take in, into consideration and also that the different sexes have the opportunity to contribute fully. Um, social inclusion, disability, and gender, it really stands for um, pretty much correcting what has been done over, over the history, that when it came to women rights, we always, always looked at uh, one specific group of women. Often there were privileged white women who had the right and the opportunity to claim their rights and everyone was considered a homogeneous group. So if we provide women's rights to one group, then it should automatically mean that everybody else has the right as well. We know now that is absolutely not the case. When we talk about women with disabilities, they have different, um, different problems, they have different needs, and they have different capacity to uh, contribute to women's rights. Same with indigenous women, same as with LGBTQI plus women and men for that matter. Um, so the social inclusion is really to, to make sure when we talk about gender equality, we don't talk about, we provide rights for women as a whole group. There are cross-sectional, there are um, um, multiple levers of discrimination and we have to address that um, by looking at the different groups and the need. It comes back to um, the point that I made um, to people centered. What we need to know first, and often the data and the statistics are lacking, that's a problem that we have in many countries. We first need to know what is needed. What do people need? We can't just assume that if you give a right to me, that a person with disability will have the same access I have. So it's really people-centered, make sure that we understand the issues of the different groups and then um, address that accordingly, based on needs, not based on assumption. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, Kai Laigo Valido uh, wants, is sharing an example from the Philippines that the, yeah. Philippines, uh, the Philippines submitted a request for inquiry through the optional protocol for gross violation of SRHR of women in Manila. Yeah. In 2015, CEDAW upheld the complaint 
and found the city of Manila liable for grave violations to women's rights, in particular to SRHR. Yeah. But I wish that we could make these local leaders accountable. It was like just issuing a ticket and a warning to them. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, the inquiry, the CEDAW optional protocol depends a little bit of naming and shaming, right? So we have sovereign states, an international body can't tell them what to do. They only can highlight the issue and hope that the government is sensible enough to then implement it and don't want to be the people who violates the rights of their women. Unfortunately, that is not the mindset of many global leaders or governments. Um, so yeah, international law always has been an animal without teeth. Um, so it depends pretty much on the goodwill and often on the, on the strength of the civil society organizations. But there we come to the other issue where we have limited civic space um, uh, dangerous um, governments for women human rights defenders, um, lack of protection and so on. So it's a very, very complex issue. And I definitely tell you, I would love to have a pseudo police. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, Irfan Ali Kokar from Pakistan wants to know what is substantive equality and what role can civil society play in the CEDA monitoring process? So substantive equality is uh, different than um, formal equality. Formal equality means that everybody gets the same rights, right? It comes a little bit back to what I explained earlier. Substantive equality is balancing the rights that, that have been originally not balanced. For example, when we talk about, um, let's talk about um, criminal justice. Um, sexual and gender-based violence is predominantly um, committed against women, right? So if we don't have legislation that pre predominantly affects women and not men, so there is an imbalance. So if we talk about formal equality, we would just give the same criminal code for everyone and hope for the best. When we talk about substantive equality, we look at what is needed and then provide sexual and gender-based violence legislation so that women are protected. So substantive equality looks at what is needed to have a balanced and equal relationship and then provides the right measures. It's not necessary that everybody gets the same rights. Um, for the um, how civil society organization can get involved in the CEDA process, this is super important and that is what the whole CEDA reporting cycle actually draws on. Um, the civil society organizations are super important, especially the shadow report. Um, those reports are actually highly valued by the CEDA committee members because that, as you can imagine, when a government writes a report about issues of women's rights in their country, they often don't want to highlight the issues that are not implemented yet. So they kind of you know, don't mention them or mention them only briefly. Well, the civil society organization can give a more comprehensive picture of what really happens in the country. And with that, educate the CEDO committee to, write the, to ask the right question and give the right recommendations. I also really recommend when your government goes to, to engage with the CEDO committee in Geneva, Go with the civil society organization to also have your site events with the CEDAW committee, because there you can then debate and, and pretty much put your questions and demands in the mouth of the CEDAW committee to translate it um, into, into recommendation that the government should follow. Um, so staying informed about what your government does uh, when they are reporting, how they want to implement the CEDAW recommendations are really important. And it gives you also a powerful tool to come together as women's rights movement. What I've noticed in many countries, you have super capable, strong civil society organization, but who work in silo. If you come together around the CEDAW general recommendation and you powerfully, as a group of women, uh, push for certain changes, you have a louder voice and you have more impact than individual civil society organizations. 
uh, Omanga Set uh, Omang Setenaike from the Asia Foundation of Sri Lanka office says with reference to GR's link to the formal justice sector, the issue of independence and neutral approach to law continues to impact women negatively. Any thoughts on this issue and any good practices that may have come out from CEDAW recommendations to countries? Yeah, okay, so that, that's a tricky one. As I understand it, so we're really looking at independence uh, and uh, um, um, a formal justice system without bias, correctly? Yes. Okay, so the, the gender bias within a, um, within a, the formal justice system is, is still quite large. Um, even in countries where you would think that's not the case. I've just recently saw a study of uh, prosecutors in Europe where the average prosecutor thinks that 30% of the women who say that they were raped actually lie. The global rate of false accusations around about 8%, not 30. So the problem of um, bias within the justice system is still super high. And um, over the years, a lot of civil society organizations have, or the UN, other international partners have um, provided training to the police, provided training to prosecutors, judges, and that is super important. But I think what is more important is actually to start with law students, <laughs> because they will be our future judges, to actually in, have the gender component already in the curriculum when it comes to, to law universities, when it comes to law schools. The other one is institutions for, 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 for example, police academy, for example, um, judicial committees. Um, so ev everywhere where our justice providers are educated, it should be compulsory to have a gender component in there. So that is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that our justice system is overwhelmed. There, there are too many cases for too too few lawyers for too few prosecutors so even a prosecutor who has good intention and who wants to do everything right has too many cases on his or her desk to actually work through it and with that because sexual and gender-based violence is incredibly hard to prove in court a lot of those cases are dropped not because the prosecutor thinks that the woman lie but because the prosecutors also evaluated how many cases he or she wins. And um, SGBV cases are really hard to do in court. So we have to not just think about, oh, it's always the evil justice provider, but it's also the system that doesn't allow the good-willed and hard-working justice provider to do their job properly. Thank you. Yasoda Kura says, thank you very much for an excellent pre presentation, Doreen. And can CEDAW recommend on changes in mandatory reporting of sexual violence cases to the police in India? She's mandatory to... reporting. Yes. Um, no, they wouldn't. <laughs> um, not because they don't can. They can recommend pretty much everything what they think is right to do. Um, but mandatory reporting has backfired in other countries. There were um, countries where, um, for example, nurses or doctors, when they saw that there was domestic violence or sexual violence, they had to um, report to the police um, that something like that happened. But that takes the autonomy away from the women. The result of that was that women just don't, didn't go to the hospitals anymore. They didn't seek the health care they so direly needed. And it's also, when you look at the formal justice system, if you decide to go through it, this is a traumatic experience. Just imagine something really <laughs> had happened to you. You had a, the worst experience of your life. And now you are forced to go through the justice chain and sit in front of a group of lawyers and people and the offenders to explain what happened to you. And then look at the, the attrition rate and look at the rates of, of offenders that are, actually, um, that are actually convicted. You might actually, as a woman, go through this case. You lose your family, you lose your community. Um, and at the end, the offender gets free. And the whole world pretty much tells you you're a liar. 
this is a super traumatic experience and nobody else but the woman should have the decision to go through that or not. Her autonomy, her autonomy was taken away why, while, she was, um, while she was sexually um, abused. And then you can't force her to go through the justice system just to make sure that the offender goes behind bars. It should always be her decision. Very, very true, Doreen, very true. Uh, Anne Neguin, I think she's in Australia these days. She thanks Doreen for her great presentation and asks, do you have any information on the practice of women's rights in Vietnam? Because Anne is from Vietnam. Uh, I'm currently working around the topic of women with disabilities in Vietnam. That's fantastic. Actually, we do have an office, UN Women does have an office and we have an access to justice project there. But I also would like to invite all of you, whoever is interested um, to drop me a line. I will put my email address in the chat um, because we are currently developing an access to justice strategy for the Asia Pacific region. And we look at civil society who are interested um, to, um, to learn more about justice and how to make a difference in their country. So if, if you want to get engaged in that, if you want to push for justice for women in your country, um, drop me a line and I'll invite you to our next consultation. Okay. <laughs> Making, make, have, promoting, promoting my work here, sorry. <laughs> no, I couldn't no. resist. <laughs> no, no. no, but that's very pertinent also. Uh, Shanta Shreshtra from BBC and wants to know how can we feminist friends ensure implementation of CEDAW in countries like Afghanistan, where the government forces women even not to come out of the house. As a feminist, how can we help people of Afghanistan and probably in a few other countries as well? Yeah, um, you know, this, this is super, this is super difficult because when you look at international law, the, you, you, you have the CEDAW committee promote specific recommendations, but when you are in a country like Afghanistan and you promote this specific general recommendation, there are no protection mechanisms in place to protect you. Uh, and that is one of the major shortcomings. Um, so raising the awareness, um, making sure that people know what's actually happened in your country, bringing civil society organizations together because the, the power lies in numbers. That's just the way it is. As an individual woman human rights defenders, you're so vulnerable. Um, but what I would like to see, what I hope to see at a certain point is that international um, treaty bodies have stronger protection mechanisms for women who actually want to enforce in their country. But as long as there is state sovereignty, um, that won't be unfortunately the case. So at this point, I would really say advocacy, make sure that your voices are heard and then um, let, uh, let the international community know exactly what kind of help you need. Because often, um, as I said earlier, when I sit in Germany and I, think about the situation of women in Afghanistan. I don't know what you really need. You need to tell me and then I can go to my government and see what I can do. So be very specific about what you need and um, yeah, advocate, advocate, advocate. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, lastly, we have a comment from Hari Singh India who works for uh, HIV positive people. And uh, he says, that HIV positive people of India are not getting benefits of the HIV AIDS law, which was passed in 2018 in the country. And the reason again is poor implementation on the ground. The state governments are not interested to notify and not provide social protection. So again, it is about implementation. It's all about implementation. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's all, around this, all around the world, the same situation. And it comes back to, gender bias, no question, but it's also uh, a lack of focus on minority groups. And it is comes back to a justice system that was created 400, 500 years ago, when the only person who could claim rights was the white rich man. Uh, and we today still try to fit everything in there. 
Um, and often, uh, especially in many countries, um, it's a colonial system that doesn't really fit your context very well because there, there, there are other issues around it. Um, so on one hand, I always say, okay, there's, there's a lot of biases, there's a lot of discrimination happening, but it's a bigger picture if your government and your justice system are not strong enough, it is a systematic issue, not just an issue of individual people who don't want to do their job. Yes, and, and it's not just about the white rich man, we have many brown rich men also <laughs> <don't we? laughs> in countries where they yeah, are. Yeah, true that. <laughs> so, thank you, Doreen, thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, vibrant interactive session. And our next speaker is Abigail Erickson, Program Specialist at UN Women Pacific Region. Uh, she's currently based in Fiji and we lovingly call her Abby. She has always been a fierce advocate for ending violence against women and girls. Unfortunately, due to some sudden family emergency, she just sent me a message that she's unable to join, but she has been kind enough to send her talk on Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. So we will play that video now for you. The talk she had prepared for today. Hi, my name is Abby Erickson and I'm the Ending Violence Against Women and Girls Advisor for UN Women, Fiji's multi-country office based in Suva, Fiji. Greetings to all of you, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present to you during this Asia Pacific Regional Training on Gender Equality and Human Rights. Um, a big thank you to CNS and the Aero teams and warm greetings from myself. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there in person with you today, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you an overview of the Beijing Platform for Action and talk a little bit about a newer initiative um, to accelerate commitments for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls that was laid out in 1995 at the Beijing Platform for Action and has been further strengthened through the Sustainable Development Goals. So first, just to say that the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, um, which was signed off in 1995, was really a visionary agenda for the empowerment of women. It still remains today one of the most comprehensive global policy frameworks and blueprints for action on pr the promotion of gender equality and empowerment of women globally. Um, it continues to be a source of guidance and inspiration to realize gender equality and the human rights of women and girls everywhere. There's several areas of focus that came out in the Beijing Platform for Action. And as I had said earlier, it's really a comprehensive policy instrument looking at all facets of gender equality and empowerment and articulating actions to improve the gaps and deficits. For example, the persistent and increasing burdens of poverty on women, the existing inequalities and unequal access to education and training inequalities and inadequacies in terms of health care and sexual reproductive health care for women, violence against women and girls, one of the central barriers to gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Also looking at overall persistent discrimination and violation of the rights of the girl child. Looking at stereotyping of women and inequality in women's access and participation in all communication systems, especially the media. And for those of you who are joining as media and journalists, this is so important to recognize the vital role in media in terms of accurately portraying um, and discussing um, and representing gender equality and women's empowerment issues through media. In addition, looking at inequality between men and women and sharing of power and decision-making, lack of respect for and inadequate promotion and protection of the human rights of women. So there are several different areas of focus that were laid out. And it's now about 26 years later and since the fourth world conference and really very little has changed. 
when we look at the persistent inequalities that exist for women and girls worldwide, whether it's education or health, or we look at the persistent violence against women and girls that continues to impact women and girls daily, we see that there are still huge challenges to achieving gender equality in the empowerment of women and girls. Over 190 million women who wanted to avoid pregnancy have not had access to contraception. It's estimated that based on the current progress, women will not achieve pay or leadership equity with men for at least another 135 years. 19% of girls globally are married before the age of 18. More than 640 million women aged 15 and over have experienced physical or sexual violence at the hands of an intimate partner. This is absolutely unacceptable. We must accelerate action. On the Beijing Platform for Action from 1995, and more recently with the Sustainable Development Goals, which has a dedicated goal on gender equality, SDG5. It is critical that we really step up and more so as well because of COVID-19. The effort is all the more urgent now. COVID-19 has laid bare critical gaps in equality that have left millions of women and girls particularly those who are most marginalized and who have experienced discrimination on multiple grounds behind. COVID-19 has exacerbated the lack of progress on gender equality by deepening poverty, increasing rates of violence, cutting off access to critical services like school and healthcare, and increasing women and girls' burden of unpaid work. The pandemic is straining health systems. We know that widening the socioeconomic gaps and shifting strategic, political, and funding priorities, all of which are disproportionately and negatively affecting women and girls. So if there wasn't already reason for us to accelerate action with COVID-19, it's all the more critical. And we know that by doing more on gender equality and the empowerment of women, everybody wins. Gender equality is critical to the survival of the planet and the rebuilding of more sustainable and thriving economies, societies, and political systems. It's estimated that intimate partner violence costs economies between 1.2 to 2.1% of GDP. We know that investments in quality childcare services have the potential to increase women's employment rates up to 10 percentage points and promote decent care jobs. More women in parliaments has also been found to increase the strength of climate change policies, which lead to lower CO2 emission, emissions per capita. It's all intersectional and intertwined, and we know that when we have more gender equal societies, everyone wins. So one effort that has, that has come about more recently to accelerate the implementation of Beijing, um, the commitments in Beijing, um, and the platform for action to accelerate this decade for action, which is 2030 to 20, 2020 to 2030, the last 10 years of achieving the sustainable development goals, is the Generation Equality Action Coalitions. Um, and this, what this is, an ex, is an extraordinary platform for change. The Generation Equality Forum is really has come on board um, to help turn words into action. The Generation Equality Forum has been a landmark global initiative for driving commitments that embed gender equality as the central component of building back better from COVID-19 and fueling significant and lasting change for generations as outlined in, in Beijing. Um, the Generation Equality Forum has action coalitions that have been developed, um, really that are the world's roadmap for gender equality. These innovative multi-stakeholder partnerships, which I'll explain in just a minute, are really focused on those critical areas of gender equality where we need to achieve more concrete change for women and girls. The Action Coalition blueprints um, you know, are really a way to help us look at gender equal societies and address these intractable barriers to gender equality, from violence to economies that rely on women and girls' unpaid work, 
to social and political systems and norms that stifle the voices and potential of women and girls and all their diversity instead of giving them a platform. These are the areas where progress has been met with backlash. Areas like gender-based violence, bodily autonomy, sexual reproductive health and rights, feminist action for climate justice, eco economic justice and rights, technology and innovation for gender equality, feminist movements and leadership. These are the areas that we must focus on. These are the areas where progress has been met with backlash, like the notion that women and girls have the right to make their own decisions about their bodies or where crises like COVID-19 have threatened reversals, such as an access to services and decent work. And the blueprints also address newer and emerging issues like technology and innovation and climate justice, where we really need to have strategies that center and ensure that women and girls are at the center of innovation and climate responses, that they're not left behind struggling to catch up. So out of the Generation Equality Forum, these six thematic areas have emerged as key areas to move forward with whole bodies of work and multi-stakeholder coalitions that have come around to develop blueprints. I wanted to just briefly touch on gender-based violence because that's one and that's the area where I work. And just to highlight um, that, you know, for gender-based violence, the vision in this action coalition of success by 2026 um, is really that multiple and diverse stakeholders continue to come together to realize the vision of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the targets that we have in the Sustainable Development Goals by making and implementing concrete new commitments to address gender-based violence against women and girls and all their diversity. The commitments must be survivor-centered and really backed by targeted and adequate financial resources and political will. We need to ensure that women's rights organizations are recognized for their expertise, that they're resourced, and they have the capacity to drive change as leaders at all levels. And that diverse voices are amplified across social and political arenas, including adolescent girls and youth. Now, why does gender-based violence matter? Why is this one of the six thematic areas? Well, because of what I had shared earlier, violence against women and girls is pervasive. One in three women will experience physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner globally. In the region where I work, the Pacific, that's two out of three women in the region. We know that violence against women and girls is widespread and it's persistent. It's a global issue. We know that we have women and girls in all their diversity experiencing multiple forms of gender-based violence. And this negatively affects physical, mental, sexual, reproductive health. It affects women's full and active participation in the labor market, seriously impacting women in the formal and informal sectors. Gender-based violence, violence against women and girls in all of their diversity comes at significant economic cost to societies and economies. It is a central barrier to the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of women, and it needs our full attention, full resources to prevent and end this violence. Thank you very much, Abigail. And I now invite Shamla Chandrasekharan, Advocacy Manager at Arrow. Shamla has a decade of hands-on experience in management of programs with particular focus on HIV, harm reduction, key populations, and so on and on. She has co-authored several publications with the HIV sector within the Ministry of Health, Malaysia. Shamla will tell us about the adoption of Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals, and she will also speak on the Universal Periodic Review. Over to you, Shamla. Thank you, Shobha. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shamla, and I'm from the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow. I will be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030, and also the Universal Pre Periodic Review or the EPR. Next. So let's start with the Agenda 2030. Um, the Agenda 2030 is basically a universal agenda and it is also referred to as the 
most comprehensive um, blueprint for global action for achieving sustainable development. The Agenda 2030 consists of um, 17 SDGs and 169 targets, and it has the aim to eliminate uh, extreme poverty, reducing inequality, and to protect the planet with a focus on the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. So the Agenda 2030 was adopted in um, 2015 by all countries of the United Nations, and it builds on the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. And um, it applies to all countries and actors, including the governments, the UN, and also other actors. Now, in the context of the SDGs, um, many of you uh, must have heard about the Leaving No One Behind commitment. Um, this leaving no one behind is actually a pledge, right? Uh, a pledge to emphasize that the um, Agenda 2030 need to do more than the average improvements in targets, including achieving um, several life-changing zeros. Again, many of you may have heard this already. This includes um, achieving zero poverty, zero hunger, getting to zero AIDS. So this pledge basically pushes for investment and efforts um, targeted at reaching those furthest behind first, as in the most marginalized first, so that no one is left behind. And um, such a commitment, uh, you'd agree, is important to accelerate progress towards achieving the Agenda 2030. Also, um, the Agenda 2030 is anchored by a multi-stakeholder approach, which is the core of the um, 2030 Agenda. And it requires commitment and dedication from all actors and societies, uh, in addition to the governments and the UN, in order to realize um, the goals of the Agenda 2030 and its targets. The interventions and actions also requires expertise, technology, and financial resources from businesses, academia, um, civil society, and individuals. You see, um, the 17 SDGs, they are connected, they, they are interlinked, meaning progress or lack of progress in one area will have an impact on the outcomes of other areas. So, um, for example, actions on um, to support women and girls empowerment and gender equality oftentimes uh, accelerate or has the power to also boost local economies and also increase women's full and effective participation, as well as equal opportunities, um, you know, like for leaderships at different levels of decision-making, including in political, economic, and also public sphere. Next. Here you see the 17 goals, to name a few, um, goal five on strengthening gender equality, goal 13 on taking climate action, Goal one on uh, eradicating poverty and 16 on promoting peaceful societies. So these are among the goals to shift into a more sustainable development uh, at the global level. Next. Now, how is um, or how are the SDGs linked with gender equality? Definitely when some communities or groups, including women and girls, are denied their full human rights and opportunities, achieving sustainable development becomes um, a target that is not possible. And as such, the Agenda 2030, um, it recognizes and emphasizes that gender equality and also the empowerment of women and girls is actually a fundamental human right and is crucial for ensuring progress across the goals and targets for sustainable development. So gender equality is sort of the core for 2030 agenda. And gender equality, in addition um, to being a goal uh, on its own, gender equality also cuts across the 17 sustainable development goals. And it is reflected, um, this is reflected in in the 45 targets and the 54 indicators of the SDGs. It basically um, envisions for women and girls to enjoy equal access to quality education, uh, economic resources and political participation, as well as equal opportunities for employment, leadership and decision-making at uh, different levels. 
Um, for achieving gender equality, the SDG aim and push for closing gender gap and strengthen support for gender equality and the empowerment of women, including at the global, uh, regional, and also national levels. It also envisions for um, all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls to be eliminated. And finally, it strongly believes in gender perspective, as in it applies gender sensitive approaches in the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in a um, holistic and inclusive manner in line with uh, its principle of leaving no one behind that I just shared. Next slide. Now, in terms of accountability, so you may have this question, right? Who, who is accountable in terms of ensuring um, the implementation of this agenda? Who does the monitoring of, um, you know, whether or not there is progress, what are the gaps and um, how the gaps are being addressed? Well, um, the governments have the primary responsibility for the implementation, for the follow-up and also the review of the implementation of uh, at all levels, including, you know, at the national, regional, and global levels, especially in relation to um, reporting on the progress made in implementing the goals and also the targets in the uh, period of 15 years. So the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Annual High-Level Political Forum, or also known as the HLPF, actually plays a central role in the review mechanism, you know, in reviewing the government's implementation of the 2030 agenda. And this meeting convenes in July on an uh, annual basis in um, UN New York. So um, the HLPF is a platform where the governments present their voluntary national reports uh, through the voluntary national review or the uh, VNR mechanism. And this mechanism is basically to update on the status uh, of SDG implementation at the national level in your respective countries. So this review um, in line with the SDGs looks into the progress, gaps, challenges in realizing the SDGs in the uh, respective country context. The VNR um, is actually an important component of uh, the review mechanism. Um, mainly to hold governments accountable to their commitments and to further mobilize efforts and identify solutions to achieve the SDGs. And um, while there is no frequency for reporting mandated for BNRs, uh, the UN Secretary General has recommended that all countries conduct at least two BNRs during the 15 years. <laughs> Participants, please mute yourself. Thank you. Yes, Shamala. Thank you. At the regional level, um, there is the annual Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development or the APFSD, which is an important part of the follow-up and also the review process of the 2030 agenda, but this is at the regional level. So, as an annual intergovernmental forum, the APFST actually supports the region to prepare for the HLPF at the global level um, by enhancing their capacity and also um, by capturing and sharing regional perspectives and supporting the review of progress uh, towards implementation of the 2030 agenda. Next. Yeah, so that's all on the SDGs. Next, uh, we will look at the UPR. Now, what is UPR? Um, the UPR is a periodic review of the human rights records of all the 193 UN member states. The UPR was established um, in 20, uh, 2006, and it is a powerful accountability mechanism for holding states accountable, including for sexual and reproductive health and rights actions. So it brings, um, it serves as a platform to bring international attention and pressure for governments to improve the human rights situation in their respective countries. It is basically a state-led and uh, peer-reviewed process which focuses on the actions countries need to take to uh, fulfill their agreed human rights obligations. So countries report once almost every five years on the actions that they have taken 
during the review period to improve the human rights situations. And these actions are um, presented as uh, recommendations. They are raised as recommendations in the past review, which the member state would have either accepted. So to say, uh, when you say accepted in UN la official language is to support, or they can uh, also say they take note of. To note means um, basically they're not accepting the recommendations and they will provide explanation, for example, that they are um, thinking of implementing it or they are not going to implement it, or maybe even they have already implemented those uh, recommendations. So overall, the review um, follows up on the implementation of past recommendations accepted by the state, and it also allows for um, discussions of new emerging human rights situations and issues and also the recommendations. Um, who conducts the review? Um, the review will be conducted by the UPR Working Group, which consists of the 47 members of the Council. There will be three sessions per year, and each session will be for two weeks. And um, a total of 14 countries will be reviewed each session, and this totals to the 42 countries per year and the total of 193 countries by the end of each UPR cycle. Next. Uh, now let's look at the documents considered at each review. So first we have the national report. The national report is basically the information provided by the state under review. Um, this report can be provided orally, and when it's provided orally, it's during the review, or the government can also provide in writing. So for information that is provided in writing, the written report should not be longer than 20 pages, and it must be submitted six weeks before the actual review in all uh, official UN languages. And uh, before they prepare the report, states are encouraged to conduct national level consultations, including um, with NGOs and other relevant stakeholders to prepare their national report. And um, so this national report contains information, including on the consultation process, what are the different briefings and processes that they have taken, uh, they have implemented at the national level, what are the international obligations? Uh, what is the state's human rights achievements and best practices during the review period? It also includes information on the challenges, gaps uh, that the state has faced in implementing the recommendations that they have accepted. And it also includes um, the country's key national priorities and commitments that the um, government intends to undertake to improve its human rights situation. Then we have the UN Summary Report, which is a 10-page compilation of information from treaty bodies, uh, as well as UN Special Procedures and other relevant UN documents um, that is specific to the state under review. This report, like the national report, must also be submitted six weeks uh, prior to the review. Next. And finally, we have the Stakeholder Summary Report, which is basically a 10-page summary report prepared by the um, Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, or the OHCHR. And it is prepared based on all the submissions received from other actors, and this includes us NGOs, um, <clears throat> excuse me, national human rights institutions, academic and also research institutions. So, as I just said, the NGO reports falls under this, and um, NGOs can submit report focused on issues and recommendations from the NGO's perspective on how to improve um, human rights conditions in, in their country. So the report can um, also focus on the implementation of recommendations from previous UPR session as a follow-up measure. And um, the NGOs can also choose to highlight new human rights violation issues in the country. And in terms of guidelines, um, NGOs can submit either individual or joint submission. Uh, so for joint submission, it's done uh, with larger coalition of NGOs. Of course, the word limit is different for these two types of submissions. 
the limit is lesser for individual submission, which is at um, 2,815. And for joint submission, you have a bit more words. It is at 5,630. The reports are submitted um, using an online system and you will actually see this link in the man manual that will be shared with you. Uh, next. And so now we will look at what happens during the review. Uh, during the review meeting, which takes place in the form uh, of an interactive discussion, the country under review will receive recommendations from the UN member states and the recommendations will be focused again on improving the human rights situation in the country. Overall, um, the meeting will be a three and a half hour interactive dialogue, and this will be held in uh, UN Geneva with the member state um, that is under review, as well as the working group. Um, also, the dialogue will be chaired by the council president. And here, the NGOs can only observe, but Prior to the session, the NGOs can um, organize informal briefings and lobby friendly member states to raise particular concern or make recommendations on behalf of the NGO as outlined in the NGO stakeholder report during the actual review. So before the review, you can actually share uh, the stakeholder report with the, with, uh, the friendly mem uh, member states uh, sharing what your recommendations are for the particular issue that you have focused on, and also ask, um, make a request to the member state to raise the recommendations on behalf of you during the review. So all the recommendations provided during the uh, review meeting will be recorded in an outcome document, which is the working group report that consists of uh, the summary of the interactive dialogue, the discussion, as well as the questions, comments, and recommendations made by the states to the country under review. Um, in addition to this, the responses by the state under review will also be recorded in this document. The um, state under review must respond to the recommendations that, has, that are raised during the a review whether, as I mentioned earlier, whether they support um, or accept uh, for implementation or they take note of the recommendation. So that is why it is very important that NGOs, um, in terms of lobbying, share their report with friendly member states to increase the awareness on the focus issue and also to encourage the member state to make recommendations to the state under review to resolve the issue. The review meeting is then uh, followed by the adoption of report by the Human Rights Council, uh, uh, where the final report will be considered and adopted during a one hour meeting by the Human Rights Council. So the state under review will indicate its position on each of the recommendations um, raised during the working group dialogue. And as I was saying earlier, the state under review, you know, have the option to either accept or um, not to accept the recommendations received. And during this adoptions, adoption, NGOs um, have the opportunity to make oral intervention, commenting on the state's stand on the recommendations. So NGOs can um, prepare their intervention based on the working group report and also the addendum report. The addendum is um, where you will find information on which are the recommendations that the state has supported and which are the ones they note. Next. Now, in terms of opportunities for engagement to sum it up, um, the opportunities include uh, the submission of NGO stakeholder report listing uh, concrete recommendations for improving human rights situation in the country. Then NGOs can also participate in the national consultation by the government to provide inputs to the national report. See, the states are always encouraged to hold national consultation with all uh, relevant stakeholders, including the civil society when preparing their report. So here, NGOs can urge the state to organize consultations and um, alternatively, NGOs can also invite government representative to community consultations for active dialogue uh, with the state when preparing the NGO stakeholder report. 
Um, lobbying friendly member states to support your recommendations and raising it during the review is also a great strategy. You can prepare a one page summary report highlighting issues of focus and your recommendations with the identified friendly member state. And as I was saying earlier, request them to raise the recommendations for you during the review. Um, one example that I would like to share is earlier this year during Nepal's review, youth-led organizations lobbied to raise recommendations on comprehensive sexuality education. And it was indeed raised by a few states during the review. Um, and the recommendation were uh, recorded in the working group report. And um, when the meeting concluded, the government actually supported the recommendations raised. So yeah, it was really satisfying to see um, the recommendations being supported by the state under review in the outcome document. Um, then NGOs can also observe the working group interactive dialogue. And finally, NGOs can deliver an oral intervention during the adoption. Um, this is an opportunity to comment on the recommendations supported and noted by the state under review, especially to further stress the importance of supporting some of the recommendations uh, raised during the review, as well as to put pressure on the implementation of the recommendations that were supported. Um, it is also important to highlight that the Human Rights Council has agreed that a gender perspective should be fully integrated throughout the UPR, and this actually allows for uh, gender uh, sensitive and uh, responsive actions and uh, approaches because uh, it basically allows for gender perspective to be integrated in all the interventions and submissions, pushing for a more gender sensitive approach. Next, uh, what happens after the review? After the review, the state is responsible for implementing the recommendations accepted and the state actually has to report back on the implementation in the next review. So they have like almost uh, 4.5 years to implement all the recommendations that they have received. For NGOs, this is an opportunity to follow up with the state uh, on the implementation of actions. NGOs, uh, once the review has been conducted, uh, has concluded, NGOs can publicize the recommendations accepted and promote action on the recommendations once you're back in the country. This uh, actually indirectly puts pressure on the government to act on the recommendations that they have accepted. Next. So yes, we have come to the final slide. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. You can, uh, for any questions, you can actually reach me at shamla at arrow.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamla. It would be great if you could just put in your email in the chat box. Uh, and friends, as Shamla has to rush to a meeting, she will not be able to take up questions orally, but will respond in writing in the chat box if you put any questions there. And thank you once again, Shamla, for finding time for this very, very important input. Uh, our next firebrand resource person, Vardarina, will share her insights on why the development justice model is so very crucial to achieve human rights for all. Vardarina works at Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, and she's co-chair of Asia Pacific Regional Coordination Engagement Mechanism. She calls herself just a simple feminist next door, thinking about dismantling patriarchy and corporate power. Over to you, Rina. Thank you so much, Shoba. Uh, it's very funny how you, I'm sorry, I start my video now. Can you, I hope that you can see me now. Hi yes. everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very funny how you quote my Twitter profile <laughs> and also the Instagram profile. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, hello everyone. I'm Rina, I'm from APWLD and then I'm actually really happy that I spoke, uh, that I'm going to speak after Sh uh, Shamara because she already mentioned about the sustainable development goals and then also the SDGs and UPR and et cetera. And then the accountability mechanism that is also happening in that two processes, right? 
So, uh, but I just want to give you a background, some framework that we in Asia Pacific, most of our civil society is actually built together this uh, model of development that we call development justice. So this is actually really uh, going, the, the development justice model is actually established uh, in relation with the with the adoption of the sustainable development goals so that time in september 2013 which is eight years ago uh, a lot of civil societies peoples and social movements from different parts of asia and pacific came together so we have the trade union we have the feminists we have the farmers we have the indigenous peoples we have the social and community enterprise you know we have the people with disabilities we came together in bangkok uh at the ministerial dialogue on post 2015 development agenda and then in that meeting there was a cso forum and then we actually discuss what we envision as the world we want right so we are we know exactly what kind of world that we don't want and then we also envision if you know we put together all the demands all the uh what you call it uh all the, all our demands together and then conceptualize it what will it look like so after that we have development justice so what i'm going to do now i know it this is uh i'm going to share you a video i don't know whether we have wait yeah uh, i'm going to share you a video of development justice is there any of you probably also see this video already okay and i'm going to share sound i hope you can see my screen yes we can yes you can and then i will try to do that We live in a world where a Bangladeshi woman garment worker, in her entire lifetime, earns less than what the CEO of Inditex earns in just four days. And this inequality is escalating. Built on the notion that development and growth go hand in hand, this profit-driven model has channeled wealth, power and resources from the poor to the rich. Only 26 people own the same amount of wealth as the world's poorest half, most of whom are women. Rich nations claim they are developing poor nations through aid and investment. In 2012, developing countries received $1.3 trillion, but lost $3.3 trillion. Who is developing whom here? Unregulated corporate greed has also worsened the global climate catastrophe. Just 100 corporations are responsible for 71% of global carbon emissions. Meanwhile, the Pacific Islands are drowning, and they have contributed next to nothing. The world is seeing its first climate refugees from Papua New Guinea. The United Nations has warned we have a little over a decade left to save the planet. Our democracy and human rights are under attack from governments, corporate greed, and war. In 2018 alone, 321 human rights defenders were killed across 27 countries, 39 of whom were women. Government spending on the military rose to more than $1,700 billion. This could have paid for the education of 1.9 billion people in South Asia, 17 times over. But it does not have to be this way. People everywhere are resisting this unjust model and demanding development justice. A model that places the poor, the marginalized, and the planet at the heart of development. It aims to reduce inequalities between countries, within countries, between peoples, and between men and women using five transformative shifts. Redistributive justice means taking wealth, power, and resources from the hands of the few and putting it back into the hands of the many. Just an extra half percent tax on the world's richest could educate 262 million children and provide health care for 3.3 million people. Cutting 10% of annual investments in the defense sector could end poverty and hunger in 15 years. 
In Chhattisgarh, India, over 1,700 farmers fought back when Tata Steel Plant grabbed land from 10 villages. The farmers were arrested but persisted. After eight years of struggle and demands to the government, Tata finally withdrew and the farmers got their land back. Economic justice means economies work for the people rather than people working for the economy. It means people and workers define and decide what their work is and where it will be used. It means their work will be recognized and valued and that workers are guaranteed decent work, a living wage and the freedom to unionize and organize. Strong unions reduce inequalities. In the last eight decades, unions have boosted wages by 10 to 20%. For years, nurses in India were largely unorganized, lowly paid, and subjected to exploitation. Six of them came together and formed the United Nurses Association. Initially based in Kerala, UNA spread across the country, using its power to bring about wage increases and better working conditions. Its efforts improved the public health care standard and led to a decrease in the nurses-to-patient ratio in many hospitals. We can wipe out discrimination, marginalization and exclusion of and violence against people of any class, race, ethnicity, caste, gender, sexual orientation or other identity. Social and gender justice includes dismantling an oppressive system of patriarchy that's being reinforced by globalization, fundamentalisms and militarism. We can repeal discriminatory laws and implement better ones that ensure women's rights, voices, agency, autonomy, and bodily integrity. Every year, one in five Kyrgyzstani women and girls are kidnapped and forcibly married off. After fierce campaigning by the women's movement, the Kyrgyzstani parliament increased the sentence for this crime from one year to eight years. Worldwide, a handful of rich countries and individuals contribute the most to the climate crisis. Environmental justice means those historically responsible should pay. It also means moving from a fossil fuel-based economy towards a feminist, fossil fuel-free future. Energy and resource democracy is possible. We can transform the economy in a just and equitable way. We can shift jobs from polluting industries to jobs in sustainable, clean, renewable energy industries led by communities and led by women. Within these sustainable economies, we can stop the exploitation of women and their unpaid care work. But this can only be done by recognizing and investing in the care economy. Through the 1980s, toxic byproduct from the Panguna copper mine in Bogotville, Papua New Guinea devastated surrounding farmland and livelihoods. This triggered a decade-long armed conflict that led to the shutting of the mine. Thousands of Bougainvilleans lost their lives. The mine has since remained shut through the efforts of the women of Bougainville, who as late as 2017 blocked a legal maneuver which could have reopened it. The community has proved alternatives to large-scale mining do exist. Many Bougainvilleans are already participating in developing these alternatives. We want a system of governance where any person, regardless of how remote, poor, and marginalized they may be, can hold the highest person in the government to account. People should have the right to make informed policy decisions and to ensure those in power are answerable and accountable to the people. Good governance means establishing policies and practices that restore the power of communities and peoples to determine how resources and state budget get used. It also means regulating multinational corporations and making trade and other economic policies transparent. In Jakarta, people and communities are taking back their power. After decades of receiving poor quality water at one of the highest water terrors in Southeast Asia, a citizens' coalition has been fighting water privatization through a class action lawsuit. While the effort to remunicipalize water continues, the country's Supreme Court has recognized that water privatization has violated the people's human rights to water. People and communities around the world have shown that a new, fairer approach to development is possible. Can our governments show courage and political will by listening to the people and taking action to change the current unjust, unequal system? It is time for us to unite and exercise our collective people's power to reclaim our rights and our sovereignty. Join us and demand development justice.
Hi everyone. Okay, so that is our video, Development Justice video. This is actually the second video that we have. We had the first one. And, and welcome back. Well, wait. Now a we turn our attention to the critical issue of the imbalances. Okay, sorry for that. All right. Yes. Uh, so that is the first, uh, the second video. And then the first video, we already have it in 2014. So this is the most updated one. And then try to actually dissect what the five transformative shift of development justice means, right? So we actually know we have redistributive justice. We have economic justice. We have social and gender justice. We have environmental justice. And then also the last one is accountability to the peoples. Some of you asked in the chat box whether that we have the translated version of this. Yes, we actually have in seven language. We have Vietnamese, we have uh, Bangla, we also have Thai, and then also we have Tamil uh, and then Nepali. So please uh, go to our website later on. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Yeah, uh, about this development justice video. But but first of all, maybe I just want to have like a quick interaction in the chat box, maybe, yeah. What is actually, just put in the chat box, the word, how this video makes you feel. What is actually that you take from this video? I'm going to wait for you a little bit. Is there any certain feeling that you get watching this video? Empowered, that's very good, Dipti, yes, empowered. Yeah, it's very empowering to see the movements that actually do, you know, already doing the development justice, right? Like we are trying to do redistributive justice by uh, land reclamation, you know, and et cetera. People power, hopeful, right? And then also very good feeling, capture, hope. All right, that's great. That's great, <laughs> that's great. Optimistic, yes, that's really great. The first video, I'm going to also send it to you. It's actually, you know, focusing on the anger, yeah, on the 2014, we actually want to make a case why there are so many feminist movements, women's rights movements, and all the other movements, social and people's movement in the world is actually one a system change. And then what we meant when we are saying that we want a system change, right? Uh, we know, like for instance, uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give some recap, right? Over the last 40 years, there's this one global economic and political system that is really defining the development model that we have. It's corporate capitalism. Yeah. This model assumes that development and growth goes hand in hand. You know, if you don't grow, then you are not developed. You know, they are synonymous. That's their belief, that's their narrative. And that the more money around, move around, the more countries develop. So that's why the need to actually have investor coming to the country and et cetera, et cetera. And then we know that this model of development, see, uh, when GDP actually, GDP growth counts as development, like I said, where war actually brings more profit than peace, which is now happening, where illness brings more profit than health, we can see it now, yeah, totally, uh, is actually give more profit to the big private companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and et cetera, et cetera. And then also, we also see how this last decade has been defined by a lot of crisis. We've seen the global financial crisis. We have the food and energy crisis. We also have the catastrophic climate crisis, climate emergency right now that we have. And then we also see now with the situation of COVID, we are going into the debt crisis. Yeah, and then also the one that we have been saying since the beginning when we are uh, doing a focus for sustainable development, there's a crisis also on the wealth, uh, inequalities, right? On wealth, power, and resources between countries, 
ya between rich and poor and between men and women and other social groups we see we say it really really clearly that time during the uh when we are doing advocacy for the sdg and then for us you know uh, for the feminist groups and women's human rights group we also see that at the root of all this phenomena and then the crisis that we have is actually the economic policies that really fail most of the world's population and most acutely women and girls. This is not just because women are more vulnerable to the human rights impact of food insecurity or the issue of environmental degradation or land and natural degradation. It is because the prevailing economic model that we have right now is actually perpetuates and often relies on the systemic discrimination and disadvantage experienced by women in order to generate growth. Right. So it's it's really clear, you know, the way that we see it, for instance, how companies participating in the global value chain is actually rely on the devaluation of women's work as a source of competitive advantage. Right. We've been used, exploited, you know, over and over again in this kind of production system. The second one, there's a lot of cutback of social safety nets, subsidies, essential public services, because it's made possible with the assumption that there is woman there available, you know, our work is available for our women's unpaid labor to fill in the gaps of care. So we, this is why feminist uh, organization usually say that neoliberal capitalism is sexist, they are patriarchal, you know, and et cetera. And then also the very way, you know, economic activity is defined requires the complete devaluation or gross undervaluation of women's unpaid care work, whether that it is at home or in family business or et cetera. So our work never considered, uh, not given any economic value, or even though that uh, without that econ economies could not function, right? So we believe actually, you know, uh, that time when we are proposing development justice, a very, very strong feminist analysis also in development justice, we believe that challenging gender equality and achieving uh, women's human rights requires also directly challenging economic policies, institution, and accounting that have entrenched social inequality and often undermine the capacity of the state to make regulation for the purpose of the people. Yeah, so this is very important aspect of development justice. And then we 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 we've seen it very very much. Yeah, for instance, I uh, just want to give like some a little bit more on what is Development Justice Frame Act. So it's framed by five transformative shifts: redistributive justice, economic justice, social and gender justice, environmental justice, and accountability to the peoples, which means like. Uh, dismantle any existing system that channel the resources and wealth from developing countries to the wealthy countries and from the people to corporation and elite. So we want to dismantle those systems. And then economic justice means develop economies that enable dignified life, decent work and living wage, and it's not based on exploitation of the peoples or natural resources or environmental destruction. So we usually say there's a very famous development justice code, which economic justice means economic that work for the people, not people working and exploited by the economy, right? And then also uh, environmental justice means to recognize the historical responsibility of countries and elites within countries whose production, consumption, and extraction pattern have led to the human rights violation, climate crisis, and environmental uh, disaster. Social and gender justice means we need to eliminate all the patriarchal system, casteisms, fundamentalisms, 
eliminate all forms of discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion that pervade our communities, and also ensuring that we have democratic and just governance that enable people to make informed decisions over their own lives, communities, and also the future. So development justice is there, the movement is there. We have been having this since 2013, and then it's a growing movement in Asia and the Pacific uh, civil society. It's our political unity in the region when we are actually talking to the government and also to the UN what we meant when we said we want system change. So I'm going to stop now. I think that I'm already over my time. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Shoba again. Shoba, go ahead. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much, Rina. And uh, for me, it was horrifying data which you gave and just uh, uh, so, sort of inspiring us to work towards a feminist fossil fuel free future. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, Nahid Khalid says, development justice model makes so much sense, but governments and even civil society often are in work in silos. Health is a different program uh, than women or gender program or climate or environment or finance or trade. How can we lobby for development justice approach in the Asia Pacific region? Yes, Rina. We can't hear you. Yeah, Shoba, I also need to leave quite early, so I, but okay. I'm trying to... Uh, okay respond to this like beautiful great questions that we have here uh i'm going to open again my my chat i'm really sorry so nahit nahit uh i believe that you're from the pacific maybe yeah because you're asking how we can lobby for development justice approach uh yes it is true that government and also civil society often work in silo and then this is also the reason why we actually want to put together that time the development justice model. So a model that is actually encompasses the issues that being felt by the Asia and the Pacific communities and the peoples, right? So that time when we are actually established this in 2013, it started with a survey, right? The survey is uh, showing, for instance, uh, the su survey is showing like what are the trends of issue that is happening now in Asia and the Pacific that time, right? And then also uh, what are the solution that uh, the civil society propose? So that's why we came together and et cetera. And then of course, you know, uh, across social movement or across people's movement uh, conversation needs to happen to make sure that us in the civil society, we are not working in siloed. And then this is what we have been trying to do uh, for, uh, in the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. We have a people's forum. Uh, I don't know whether that Shamala mentioned it uh, beforehand. So before the EPFST, which is going to happen on the 28th until 30 March the, uh, next year, we're going to have a three days People's Forum, when all the movement, you know, cross sectoral, it's coming together and then try to consolidate our position, what we want for the for the next HLPF and EPFSD, and then what are the systemic issues that we can still feel now, right? So uh, that is one thing, and how we actually put uh, civil society not working in silo. But of course, the, the government is a different thing. I think that for some, you know, when we are talking about climate justice, historical responsibilities, the issue of debt, the issue of, you know, how the uh, debt cancellation, for instance, it also resonates well with the, with the member state in our country, right? So it, it is, we have a potential actually to actually push for development justice model with our government. The problem is our governments in Asia Pacific are horrible for the gender equality and women's human rights. So this is something that we need to also strategize and understand and how we capacitate and then also try to get allies, you know, and et cetera. So yeah, I'm going to check whether that I have another one. 
Uh, what you are saying is very ideal, but how to start pragmatically when the problems of inequity are systemic, deeply rooted, where do we start? I do agree, Calvin. The thing is, not so many people talking about the systemic part of it, right? The systemic issue. A lot of time when we are talking about SDGs and then, uh, you know, the UN, the government always say that, let's hear the solution, yeah? Let's not talk about the problem. We want the solution. What is actually pragmatic? What is actually what we can do, you know? But for us, it cannot be a clinical solution. It cannot be a band aid solution. If we're talking about justice, right? So there should be a good exposure what we meant uh, by injustices, right? So this is, this is the issue that we also want to highlight because only then we can actually do some systemic change or, uh, yeah, we, we can do some system change if the system that is, uh, you know, really make us suffer and oppress us is actually exposed, dissect, unpack, and then dismantled, right? So this is something that we do pragmatically. What, what some people, some of us done is that using this development justice indicators, we actually monitor the sustainable development goal. So we're not using the SDG uh, indicators that are uh, made by the government. When they are talking about goal two, we, we, all, we, we, we are not only talking about the, how many uh, women or uh, people are malnourished or don't have land, you know, but we also track, you know, what is actually the land grabbing issue in the country, right? We track who own the most of the land, how many percentage of that land actually belong to the uh, small land, uh, uh, small farmers, and then how many of those, you know, uh, belong to women, Right. So that kind of thing that we can do is actually to really put like evidences of why this model of development is not working. Uh, I hope that's yes, thank enough. You. Yes, thank that's you. It. I think it answers many of the questions. And of course, we can go on and on and have a separate session altogether for uh, to talk more about development justice. Uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you very much. And uh, Rina mentioned corporate capitalism. And our next speaker, Mona Sabela, will elaborate on how what we call corporate capture is being used by the economic elite to usurp the realization of human rights. So I now invite Mona Sabela, who is coordinator, who coordinates global action on corporate accountability at the International Network for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, ESCR Net. And she believes as all of us do, I think that people's well being must always be placed before profit. Over to you, Mona. Yes, we are waiting for Mona. I hope she's there. Okay, I think there is some, some video there. The coal mining company promised us jobs, development, and a booming economy. Some of us did get jobs, but life became harder with little control over our daily schedule. And soon, our baby got sick with no signs of getting better. And we weren't the only ones who were getting sick. I had to get to the bottom of this. What I found was a complicated story involving elected representatives and business people working together and changing any law that got in their way. This problem is bigger than me. I knew I had to join with other voices to be heard. They heard me and tried to silence me. And it felt hopeless. The doctors, politicians, the police all believed that the company was only trying to help. 
Thanks to a network of human rights defenders, I got my freedom back. And my voice is even louder now. Because this problem is bigger than our community. It's not just about one coal mining company taking over our community, our health, and our lives. It's how they do it. And how did the people who are supposed to represent us begin speaking for the company and convincing us to trust the company too? It's a complicated story, but one thing is clear. Company profits are being considered more valuable than our lives. So how do we fight for people over profits? The human rights community has started to use the words corporate capture to refer to this trend of corporations taking over our hard-won democratic institutions. Corporate capture happens when companies manipulate our local governments for their own private profit. It happens when politicians favor the corporate donors who fund their campaigns over the people they're elected to represent. It happens when elected officials go on to work for the corporations they use to regulate, and when corporate employees get appointed to public positions. Because corporations understand the power that we have as a community, they invest their resources to convince us that they are socially responsible corporations. Much like with what happened to us here, that mining company opened up a community hospital and donated medicine to distract us from knowing that they're contributing to the cause of our illness. All of this is corporate capture. Together, we must start exposing corporate capture and demand that our governments do their jobs and protect our rights. Do you think you've seen corporate capture happening in your community? Share your story by answering this short survey at escr-net.org forward slash cc. Yes. Hello, no. friends. Yeah. Sorry, Shobha, go ahead. No, no. I was giving it over to you only. Okay. All right. So, friends, uh, Mona hasn't been able to log in yet, I think, because she's in Palestine and maybe there is a time difference issue or some problem I'm not very aware of. But this is the video which we saw on corporate capture, which CNS was also part of. We were part of the corporate accountability working group of ESCR net and organizationally too. And um, so you would you would have seen how um, you know how um, corporate capture manifests in, in this video. Uh, uh, so um, so yeah. So corporate capture, friends, uh, the, uh, there was a group of around 300 organizations around the world which tried to uh, uh, define corporate capture, how they have seen corporate capture impacting their lives, including uh, from gender perspective. And uh, this is a definition which, which came up from the communities that corporate capture refers to the means by which an economic elite undermine the realization of human rights and the environment by exerting undue influence over domestic and international decision makers and public institutions. The elements of corporate capture were identified and they were and there could be more. So please be welcome to you know uh, suggest um, uh, you know more. And uh, one was community manipulation, for example. So we saw in several instances where corporations were trying to um, uh, uh, ca capture either domestic or international decision making, we found community manipulation, which refers to the corporate undermining of community decision making processes related to different projects. And uh, then there was economic diplomacy, which was a corporate capture where uh, diplomatic via diplomatic missions, which advance the interests of corporations from their countries operating in foreign countries. Uh, there was judicial interference, which you and I and also many of us who have been involved with different activism, you will we, we will see it in a manifesting in our own countries in our own context. Legislative and policy interference, as the name uh, is suggests. Uh, then privatizing public security services. This is uh, was very important, especially in, in, in very specific countries where the, even the public security services 
was being privatized, which involved provision of a salary or other inducement by corporations for police, army, or other public security services uh, to act in their interest against local communities. Revolving door policy, even now in India, for example, we are seeing um, um, that uh, corporations or cor people who are working in corporations are being, I think they call it lateral entry, where they are being placed directly into bureaucracy in different ministries across the ministries. But you know this uh, revolving door uh, component of corporate capture where um, employees uh, move from corporate sector to public regulators and other agencies and vice versa uh, is in the process of undermining the impartiality of these agencies uh, is, uh, is um, you know, we have seen it in several other uh, spheres. Uh, shaping narratives is another one. Uh, which we are seeing it more and more uh, development justice narrative, which we just heard from our dear friend Rina. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, like that should have been the dominant one. And one day it will, because of the people power, that's what we believe. But uh, right now you will see if you pick up any uh, newspaper or magazine or TV, most likely you will see a very different narrative. Uh, then the capture of academic institutions was another one which was identified. So this was corporate capture. Uh, in in brief, if there are any questions or any any experiences which you all will like to uh, uh, share, you are most welcome. I can take some part or uh, some circle try to respond on behalf of Mona uh, or or CNS or ESC Anet. But uh, let us know. There is a question what from PNG you for you, I think. Sure. Uh, uh, is it in the chat? Yes, it is in yeah. the chat box. Okay. It says, is there corporate capture in other things discussed earlier today? What can we do about it? Okay, very, very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, let me open the chat first. Yeah, okay. It's a very important question. So, so the so small answer is yes. Like corporate capture, you will find uh, because the, the, you know, any, what Rina was talking about in the development justice framework, whether it is uh, efforts for gender justice, health justice, uh, climate justice, social justice, redistributive justice, you will find that the interests of those who, who have seized or, uh, you know, amassed most wealth, power, entitlements, rights, uh, and uh, deprived a large majority of people of their rights, entitlements, resources. You will find that uh, the, you know people who are though that small little one person. Those are they are they are the ones who are under threat. So you will find they are the they are they are definitely trying to block progress on implementation in one way or the other. And uh, so uh, so small answer is yes. Yeah, and what can we do about it? So we need to have policies in place for first of first and foremost of conflict of interest policies. Corporations should not have a have a seat on the table, especially for problematic corporations. Um, 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 on where we are de de discussing development policy, where we are develop we are discussing development justice policy where we are discussing climate justice policy, where we are discussing health policies, for example. And there is there are examples where governments have advanced policies to kick out corporations from the seat of the table. And one of them is the Global Tobacco uh, Treaty, the, which is formally called as World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It has a policy on Article 5.3, which says that tobacco corporations cannot have a seat on the table when we are discussing tobacco control, because it, the whole problem of tobacco control is because of the industry. So industry may be a partner for government in trade, but not in when we're discussing about health and protecting lives of people from tobacco use. So, so in tobacco control treaty negotiations, WHO FCTC is a global tobacco treaty uh, ratified by over 180 countries. It is a legally binding corporate accountability and public health treaty. So, it, so tobacco industry cannot have any say in that uh, in that room where these treaty negotiations are taking place. But this kind of policy uh, firewall is not there when you look at the UNFCCC, for instance, the climate, uh, climate treaty space or other treaty spaces. So we need this kind of policy frameworks to safeguard, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 decision making and public policy. Any other uh, comments, questions, or we can move ahead here. 
thank you, Bobby. I think we can move ahead. Okay. And uh, we are wait. Yes. Shubha, sorry, uh, there is a very quick question from Nahid. I think. Okay, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Nahid has said that is there any example of of um, uh, five point three help government to stop tobacco companies? So the quick answer, Nahid, is yes. I know we are running behind the time, but the quick answer is yes. So, for example, in India, because uh, over one hundred and eighty countries are obligated to, um, uh, you know, to the uh, to globe to follow global tobacco treaty, including India. So many years ago, I think in 2011 or 12, uh, the tobacco industry was trying to have an event and see government sponsorship, and government has paid the money. So activists, uh, friends of ours, went to the court, and the court uh, court ruled that government of India is obligated to uh, Article 5.3 of the Global Tobacco Treaty. So they, they cannot uh, they cannot participate in tobacco industry event and tobacco industry event has to return the sponsorship money to the government back. So, and no government employee will go to the back. There were three decisions. There are many more examples. This is a very small one. So for example, when Australia tried to implement plain packaging, uh, then uh, Philip Morris, if I, if I remember correctly, dragged it to the court. And uh, so that the Uruguay, for example, when it tried to implement strong tobacco control policies, tobacco industry dragged it to the court. So there are a lot of uh, examples where governments have protected themselves from 5.3 because they have obligation to protect public health policy uh, from tobacco industry interference and very recently just two three weeks back governments of, of, of all the 180 plus countries which have ratified the global tobacco treaty they they in for in they leverage this 5.3 policy to say that all the government delegates have to submit a written delegation uh, to, uh, to a declaration to the uh, before coming to the conference of the parties to the global tobacco treaty uh, declaring that they have no conflict of interest because there were inc inc instances where uh, uh, yeah, tobacco industry was trying to even bribe there was a bbc expose documentary uh, on on how tobacco industry is trying to bribe so i think uh, so the quick answer is 5.3 is helping uh, it, it may not be very ideal, but definitely we need policies in place. And of course, we need to enforce uh, such kind of policies to stop conflict of interest and corporate interference in development policy. Thanks, Shubha. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, let us now hear from Biplabi Shrestha. I hope she is there. Uh, she is program director at Arrow. And uh, she will talk on how the rising resurgence of religious fundamentalism, capitalism, and militarization are threatening gender justice and human rights in the Asia Pacific region. So okay. over to you, Beplabi. Thank you, Shobha. Can you hear me? Very clearly, yes. Great, okay. And thanks to my colleague, Evie, who is running the slide because I couldn't get into the, the thing. <laughs> it's already reached the capacity, so well done on all the participation. Uh, so when I was preparing this presentation, I was thinking that, wow, these are really, really huge topics for me to cover in 15, 10 to 15 minutes. But I'm so glad for the previous speakers who actually covered like, you know, some of the concepts already. So here in my presentation, I will actually um, enter, I mean, like, you know, my entry point will be religious fundamentalism. And then I'll go on to connect the dots with other issues. But then I'll also zoom in a little into the impacts of um, SRHI, sexual and reproductive health and rights as well. And before I start my presentation, the information that I'm going to share here are like, you know, it's based on our Arrows uh, flagship publication known as AFC, Arrows for Change, which was published in 2017. And there were like several art, uh, authors, multiple authors who contributed their articles. So the, the, the information that you see here is based on this. And at the end of this slide, you will also see a link to the publications. Next. Right, so just to like start by discussing a little bit of what do we understand by religious fundamentalism and what other like, you know, uh, concepts that is attached to is right. So as we all know, religious fundamentalism as a political and cultural force is really global and it cuts um, across most, if not all religions. 
Uh, there are extreme interpretations of religion that are espoused and used for political gain by many kind of groups. And like, you know, that's how we hear some in Buddhism, Christianism, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, and other faiths who promote attitudes and policies which have devastating con uh, impact, especially on women and uh, gender non-conforming people. And religious fundamentalism, it's uh, intertwined with other political trends, which can be best described as ethno-religious nationalism. And these three terms, like, you know, this nationalism, ethnicity, and religion, they are by and large powerful uh, and uh, patriarchal concepts. And ethno-nationalism uh, ethno is also a form of nationalism based on ethnicity. And they are taken to the most extreme, sometimes like, you know, that it it's it is expected that the citizens in a state should be limited to one ethnic or cultural group right and we also see actually various conflicts arising from this and there is also ethno-religious nationalism that is fueled by both ethnic and religious identity which reinforces that the political legitimacy of the state is primarily derived from adherence to religious do uh, doctrines ethno-religious nationalism also seeks to fuse the state uh, geographical territory, uh, cultural and religious text and impose and define it through bodies. So it is a huge threat to equality. Um, and like, you know, I don't have to name all the all the inequalities that has been perpetuated by these uh, by these threats and also especially the gender justice and Rina has already described what gender justice um, mean for us, right? So in the past, countries professed secular democracy as the way ahead, but today uh, nations are also adopting uh, national religion religions in order to propel themselves in this 21st century we are in. Hence, there is this like, you know, Buddha Sri Lanka or a Christian America or a Hindu India or a Muslim Turkey, right? So in a number of countries, the national religion is also affiliated most often with the dominant or, or like, you know, who are the majority racial or ethnic group. And the strident call of these patriarchal policies are guised under uh, democracy and equality of women, of citizens who belong to ethnic and religious minorities and of sexual minorities and acceptance of diversity are all singled out as threats to the majority. Interestingly, this phenomenon is also apparent across continents, race and religion. Next. So ethno-national religious framework provides no solution, right? Um, though religion is a crucial part of the phenomenon, it is not the only part, right, of the problem. It is not the only problem we have. So there is rising poverty, deep inequalities and inequities. There's lack of access to opportunities and resources, poor governance and low levels of education. There are also the grounds that give birth to ethno-nationalist discourses. And this perpetuates the easy identification of the other, right, as the one who takes away resources and opportunities and causes poverty and inequality. But the ethno-national religious framework, they provide no solution, though they claim to uh, do so, uh, to this rising poverty, inequality, and instability. Uh, this also do not challenge economic policies, especially neoliberal economic ones, which continue to deepen uh, poverty, inequalities, and inequality, uh, inequities. So instead, what it does is that it considers pluralism and liberalism, uh, liberal, liberal idea, ideologies, which grant equal rights to the other and empower the other over the majority, and hence it considers those who profess liberalism and pluralism most often which who are feminist groups or lgbtiq activists or like you know um, um the other activists or human rights defenders as those who stand in the way of this religious majoritarian and also ethno-nationalist state and its success as such they are considered the enemy of the state and they also become the other and this othering spills over to different groups over different issues so yes, so when we talk about this issue, what we need is not just freedom of, but also freedom from religion, right? While championing freedom of religion, we need to also equally champion um, freedom from religion. And this, there, there's this need for like, you know, equal investment, especially in young democracies of strengthening democratic institutions which are able to check the power and influence of religious institutions and provide redress when um, rights are violated. And there is also a need to be like, you know, for the greater interrogation where religion is utilized by power, powerful people, to cloak their uh, actions in religiosity and distract the people from the larger issue of development, governance, and accountability. So 
religious authoritarianism and neoliberal economic policy, they are very interlinked. Um, and these are bolstered by capitalism, sexism, xenophobia, where like, you know, there's also this huge fear of immigrants, especially in the context that we are in now. And there's also a huge um, global refugee crisis. There's also militarism and an unrelenting diminution of the importance of individual and collective human life. Then like, you know, this concept of terrorism, it becomes intertwined with the other, the, the other, the otherization that I was talking about in the earlier slide, whether, whether that is the East, the South, the North or the West, right? And there's like, you know, this defense industries that have emerged who are propped up with sales of booming drones and also planes and ships, transporting armies to areas where religion, depending on your perspective, um, is practiced or positioned as a restrictive and dangerous, right? What this does is this further uh, perpetuates abuse and manipulation of religion. Um, it's like, you know, or daunting economic conditions and especially conditions of global inequality, lack of economic opportunity and other effects of capitalism and corporate greed. Uh, there's also, this also perpetuates uh, misuse of government and political power and unyielding military militarism and patriarchy. So these are not only linked in and of themselves, but they are also have an important thread woven throughout, right? And they all have this very distinct gendered implications. And some of this simply limit rights, but some of them actually kill rights. So um, these pose uh, challenges to sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and gender non-conforming people. So uh, religious fundamentalism, it's generally grounded in a quest for political power that denies uh, rights of women and gender non-conforming people. Then it limits their expressions of sexuality and also tries to regulate their body, not tries to actually, they are already doing it, right? And women overall and people who do not fit into the societal norms, they really uh, related to gender and sexuality. They are often targeted in all religion um, uh, with impunity. So extremis, extremism uh, that rests on the manipulation of ideas about religion has policy and real life implications. And in terms of sexual and reproductive health and rights, the attitudes and political goals that are fueling religious extremism are the forces that withhold uh, contraceptions. Right? that they also deny sexuality education and services. They also criminalize abortion seekers and providers. They bar and penalize marriage across caste, race and religion, uh, uh, religious boundaries. They arrest lesbians and gay men or like, you know, um, and also justify attacks on sex workers and also transgender people. They kick gender non-conforming young people out of the homes and schools. So these all phenomena is already happening in our societies perpetuated by the fundamentalisms, right? So for women in particular, these are also the forces that allow rape in marriage, uh, deny decision making about choosing partners and having or not having children, punish political participation and make rights to inheritance or like, you know, land ownership um, illegal. And the resurgence of religion's influence in public and political spaces also reinforce the patriarchal attitudes that validate male dominance and control over women. And this is what exactly Rina was talking about, like, you know, how while we are trying to resolve this uh, issue, uh, we cannot just be talking about the, 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 the visible problem. Right? There is this entire this structural inequalities that we have to address. And this is, I mean, like, you know, we have to really go, go to that level, right? So what happens is women also becomes in this um, conservative and fundamentalist context that we are in, women become sites upon which various versions of religious scriptures, traditions, law are also elaborated and contested. And women's body especially are often conceived as belonging to society and the family and women are seen as the bearers and reproducer for, reproducers of culture and tradition. And we actually see this a lot in, uh, and like, you know, experience a lot in the, in the countries with conflict as well, because like, you know, either they have to contribute to the number of population or they have to restrict to the population, right? So there are so many restrictive and like, you know, um, systemic uh, violation of SRHR that is happening in all these contexts. Next. So uh, these are my last two slides. Uh, so what should we be our demand from the states, right? This might sound a lot and like, you know, big demands, but our states have to really fulfill these demands because they have 
also um, is committed to the human rights, right, in, in, in various uh, formats and forms. So our states should remove any reservations on the basis of religion and protection rights of religious groups. And this also include rights of some religious groups over others from human rights conventions, including CEDA. And we talked about CEDA in the previous um, uh, presentations. Uh, states must also implement the stipulations of human rights mechanisms in totality and recognize its obligation towards rights holder uh, while ensuring that it puts in place mechanisms that can operationalize these requirements. States should also decouple uh, religion from faith, morality, and human values and minimize, if not remove, the influence that religion has on laws, policies, and institutions. Uh, state officials and politicians should avoid the politicization of religion and its use to gain greater support and power amongst their constituencies. And states should also enable mainstream progressive interpretations of religion and encourage practices of multiculturalism, pluralism, diversity, and non-discrimination, not just between communities, but also within communities and also for the marginalized. So I just am leaving you all with these two quotes from the, like, you know, there, as I said earlier, there were several authors. Uh, so I just, because I mean, like, you know, this actually summarizes what we should do as civil society, right? Or as activists or as advocates, what we should do. One is challenging fundamentalist agenda is one intersectional theme that links human rights defenders in all religions and across themes. And this is clearly a moment for collective bold resistance and protest, which we are actually already doing, uh, whether in terms of gender and sexuality or any other rights issues. Um, so the other uh, author is also Siva, who has said that if we want during these tumultuous times to endeavor to move forward uh, towards equality, uh, freedom and non-discrimination, we need to form allies across all progressive movements, which work across the boundaries of race, religion and gender and provide a strong united front, which is able to um, challenge the hegemony of ethno-religious nationalism. And these understanding and actions are the only way towards the gender justice. And the last slide is like where you will see the publication that I was talking about. And I'll end there. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bipu, and so well said. And actually, we need to change the narrative at the ground level. I think it is very important and uh, have that sort of unlearning and relearning processes for dif different genders. We have been fed with uh, so many, uh, perhaps what we call lies, that we start believing in them. And I have met women who have said, uh, well, it's OK if we don't claim uh, a right uh, in property, in the family property. It's okay if we are expected to do so many things because that is what they have been fed on. So you are very right in pointing that out. And uh, the narrative has to change, I think. And uh, talking, talking to women on the ground, those, those who are actually at the receiving end of this, and they accept. Even, you know, for I would like to mention something about uh, uh, menstruation and uh, women believing that they should not be part of any religious function or not go to the temples. And I have met so many so-called educated and well-placed women and they say, well, that is what we have been told to do. And uh, we have never questioned whether it is right or wrong. So I think that is important. And I think there is a question from Nahid. Uh, uh, Vipu, will you read it or should I read it for you in the chat box? If you could read that be yes, because yes. I'm not logged into the... Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Nahid says... We are seeing more and more religious fundamentalism, militarization, and corporate capture in Pakistan, as well as other nations. Women, uh, women rights on gender justice are, for, are a forgotten piece. This is an important part of session for me because it helps me link things. And then uh, Hain Wenton says, the word freedom from religion has uh, uh, most of, uh, uh, holds most of the discussions. How can we find words that collaborate of co-inhabiting empowerment with religion? Yeah. So, um, so the participant from Pakistan, yes, we are actually seeing this in, not just in Pakistan, but increasingly in other countries also. And I just wanted to add here that how COVID is also being used as an excuse to like, you know, perpetuate some of these ideologies that are very harming to the human rights and like, you know, human beings, right? Um, so what is the next question, uh, Shubha? The, the next question is, what are your thoughts, uh, sorry, the word freedom from religion, 
halts allotment it stops many discussions how can we find words that collaborate or cohabit uh, or they collaborate empowerment with religion is there some meeting point or this is what uh, the question is about yeah so you know um there are actually some of our partners in in i mean like when they were doing this piece of work that who actually looks at the text like religious text and because when we are talking about this religious Uh, uh fundamentalism there's a lot of mis- misinterpretations that are also happening right there's also uh misinterpretations plus also like narrow interpretation of the text that is happening right so what we can do is to uh, or like you know what some of our partners are doing is to uh read those texts and like you know and go and say that okay this is actually not what it meant like you know because it also depends on who is interpreting this text text religious textbooks right or who is actually interpreting the text right of or or the religion it itself right so i think that is one that could be one of the ways but the other also could be to identify progressive li- religious leaders and which we are like you know i don't know whether we should say for sure <laughs> or not but we do have some religious uh, uh, leaders who are progressive uh, when it comes to some of these issues maybe collaborating with them and like you know sensitizing them and through them to like you know go to the communities can be another way of um, approaching this issue as Well. Uh, thank you there's a question from queen leong uh, that what are your thoughts about pushing for the separation of state and religion including faith based political parties i think it has to be totally separate mm-hmm. there's no like you know um, it's actually quite unfortunate that a lot of our um uh, policies laws and even constitutions are like you know continue to be guided by religion and as i was saying earlier like you know religion is different things for different people right but to who is influencing is the ones who have the power in hand so i would say that you know it has to be separate it has to be uh, uh, the, the, the 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 yeah the state has to be actually the governance has to be separate from the from the religion because i mean like you know a lot of um, um the the violation of the rights or like you know discrimination emerges from there because it's always then like you know the those who are in the power those religious group who are in the power and this there can be no country where you can only have people following just one religion right there are other religious people who are following other religion also but then when the state and the religion comes together if there are a lot of other people or people who do not follow the same religion they are systemic systemically marginalized and we have seen this in many countries so if you ask my personal this thing i would say that it has to be uh, separate thank you very much vipu uh, and actually this is an ongoing conversation and maybe lot more time is needed but yes the dialogue should remain there and dialogue and conversation is very important so thank you once again and our last but definitely not the last speaker for today is sai jyotirmay rachela um, deputy executive director uh, at aro a feminist and an advocate of women's rights sai has more than in fact almost 25 years of experience working on issues of right to health maternal health gender and sexual and reproductive health and rights today she will take stock of the progress made on the ground on the various global promises made by our leaders in advancing gender equality and human rights in the region over to you sai thank you shobha and uh, good day to everyone uh thus far what we have seen since uh, uh since uh, the beginning of this uh, whole training is um uh, what has what have been the different global commitments pertaining to gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights um and i have also uh, understood that some of the uh, speakers have uh, also looked at what is the situation in reality uh, what are the numbers telling us and what is uh, actually the situation uh, in regards to gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, i've also seen some of the speakers actually talking about making changes in the structural and the systemic uh, domains of work in order to make this whole impact and to ensure that gender equality actually happens um i think my presentation will basically summarize everything um and then basically take stock of what has been the progress on walking the talk um what has been the progress around gender equality and human rights in the asia pacific region uh we can go to the next slide so um what i've done is i've chosen the framework of um the sdgs 
because whether we are talking about the ICPD program of action, the Nairobi commitments, whether we are talking about the Beijing platform for action and the uh, uh, Generation Equality Forum uh, commitments. Um, at the end of the day, uh, looking at uh, the SDG framework, which is the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, this is something that many of our governments are, um, are more or less, uh, they are aligned to, they are aware of it. And in many of our countries, we know that some of the planning uh, commissions and uh, different government uh, departments are working towards um, ensuring that the SDGs are implemented. So um, very specifically, we all know that um, in 2015, our governments have uh, adopted the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. It has 17 goals. And within the 17 goals, there is one goal that is focused on uh, gender equality, and that is goal five. Uh, within this uh, goal, you have about six targets. The first one is focused on ending all forms of discrimination. The second target is focused on ending all forms of violence uh, in public sphere and in private sphere. The third target is focused on eliminating harmful practices, harmful practices such as child marriage, early and forced marriages and female genital mutilation. The fourth target is looking at uh, recognizing and valuing unpaid work. Uh, the fifth target is looking at uh, participation, decision making, and political representation of women. And uh, towards the end, the last target is looking at un ensuring uh, universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And if you follow this target, it actually says in accordance with the program of action of the ICPD, which is the International Conference on Population and Development, and the Beijing Platform for Action, and the outcome documents. And that's the reason why I have chosen this framework in order to take stock. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So, uh, so now let us see what is exactly happening in the region in regards to uh, gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, many of our speakers have also talked about this, and we have to sadly say that the Asia and the Pacific region is not on track to achieve any of the 17 SDGs by 2030. The COVID-19 pandemic has actually put uh, the gear towards the reverse gear, and it has further um, exacerbated the inequalities. And in the current trajectory, the region may achieve about less than 10% of the SDG targets. Um, when it comes to evidence, the evidence is also very limited on gender equality. Uh, and this evidence or the data that is present, it does not take into account the full spectrum of gender identities, um, uh, such as including LGBTIQ+. And uh, there is very little data for um, that is available. I mean, in terms of uh, the most recent 2021 SDG progress report, it actually says that two out of the nine SDG targets could be measured and the data that are available um, uh, show that the progress is low, which means that on many other targets where there are indicators, we need to still uh, have our national statistical offices uh, generate data and uh, be able to generate that data. Uh, available data uh, against the SDG indicators, it highlights significant inequalities for women, for girls, and uh, for marginalized communities. And, and as I have just said, that the data gaps are very much, um, there is a huge, um, there's a big gap in uh, actually even collecting data around the respective indicators. Can we go to the next slide? So um, uh, I have shown you the targets, the different targets, and target number one is ending all forms of discrimination against women and girls everywhere. Um, here you will also see that, again, it's a very binary way of looking at um, the targets. Uh, and if you look at this target, it actually calls for the removal of discriminatory laws, 
but also establishing legal frameworks that promote, enforce, and monitor uh, gender equality. Uh, this can be laws and policies around gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. It can include um, um, uh, policies, plans, um, and also the allocation of financial resources. And this target basically monitors um, uh, that aspect. And what is the result? The result is that there has been uneven progress in ensuring legal reform to remove discrimination and promote gender equality. And uh, uh, I've heard Bipu say, I've also heard Rina talk about it, and especially in our South Asian countries, patriarchal values and social norms, these keep the gender inequalities alive and there are discriminatory practices which even begin before birth. So um, even to just give an example, um, when it comes to um, the marital rape, for instance, this is not recognized, um, it is not criminalized in India. And um, India uh, amongst the Southeast, uh, South and Southeast Asian countries um, uh, constitutes a large proportion of women. And again, these are those discriminations that we are talking within the legal framework. A lot of work has to be done within this target. Uh, we go to the next slide. Again, the second target on violence, and this measures intimate partner violence, and it also measures uh, non-partner violence, such as people who you do not know. And for the Asia and the Pacific region, the most recent data actually says that the prevalence of such violence is about 15 to 64%. And this actually women have disclosed that they have experienced physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime. We can go to the next slide. And this is just a graph. This is from UNFPA, which actually shows that uh, among the, and we do not have very much of data around violence against women. And of the data that is available, uh, it, uh, uh, this graph basically points out to um, the uh, percentage of women who have disclosed that they have experienced violence by an intimate partner in the last 12 months, which is the orange. And then the gray uh, uh, circle points out to who have experienced violence um, uh, in their lifetime. So uh, the orange is in the last 12 months and the gray is around the lifetime. And here you see some of our, the data for some of our countries. Um, there, uh, Papua New Guinea, it's 58, Bangladesh, uh, uh, 54, and uh, uh, countries like um, uh, Timor-Leste, 59, uh, uh, Vanuatu, 60, Fiji, 64, and this is what is the uh, current data that is pointing out to uh, violence against women. We can go to the next slide. So um, the other target, which is on unpaid care work, uh, there are lots of challenges in regards to unpaid care work and the women's movement is, uh, um, is very, um, is uh, as a strong advocate in order to push for unpaid care work uh, to be recognized. And, um, and this is a huge fault line. Uh, efforts to accelerate progress, this must be doubled because we do see that labor force participation, there is a huge gap. We need to reduce the number of female youth who are not in employment, although they have education, they are not in employment or in education or in training. And we also need to ensure women's role in decision-making and also tackling um, uh, violence and harmful practices uh, around uh, women and girls. Now, the other uh, data set that, you, uh, that we look at is women and girls spend as much as 11 times more of their day than men and boys on unpaid care work, the reproductive work, the taking care of children, the taking care of elders in the family. And this is work and this is domestic work and that is not recognized. Cleaning uh, and collecting fuel. Um, uh, a lot of uh, women and girls, they even drop uh, the children, their girl child, 
they actually drop out of school in order to go collect fuel for the families or even collect water. And this continues. Uh, we have not yet progressed from here in uh, many of our rural, uh, rural villages. We can go to the next slide. The, uh, the other one, uh, the other target is on ensuring uh, opportunities for leadership and uh, decision making. And uh, uh, taking stock, we see that in terms of access to economic and productive resources, women have less access than men to financial services, productive assets, uh, including land. The land ownership is mostly by um, the uh, men, and it is uh, uh, in most of the cases, women do not have land rights. Uh, Rina has also talked about this. And women's representation in decision making and leadership um, is also uh, very low in comparison to men. We can go to the next slide. So uh, the last target, and uh, that target is very much focused on universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights in alignment with the ICPD program of action in Beijing. And ICPD program of action in Beijing actually give substantive content in order as to how universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights can be realized. And we all know that uh, our, our systems, our health systems are um, not uh, as good, they are not as functional. And the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown that our health systems are not able to cope with, um, uh, with handling any kind of uh, emergencies. And, um, and as a result of which, you also see that sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, services and uh, services are, um, uh, are, uh, are difficult to access for, uh, for everyone. Uh, and especially marginalized, uh, especially young people are at a double disadvantage in terms of access to SRH services. Uh, just taking stock based on, like, uh, yes, we can go to the next slide, and taking stock on the most recent data, and this is in the context of COVID, uh, metadata mortality, we have made some improvements uh, over the period of time in order to reduce metadata mortality, but, uh, but as a result of COVID-19 in the last two years, the metadata mortality ratio, the estimates show that it can increase in 14 Asia Pacific countries that are already having a huge burden of metadata deaths. Uh, and the numbers are very bad. I mean, in worst case scenario, they can be as much as 263 um, uh, per 100,000 live births. Um, and in the best case scenario, it can be as much as 214, which is the maternal mortality ratio. This is the projection. And why so? Because the priority is going to, um, um, to managing COVID which should be also the case, but then sexual and reproductive health services are being deprioritized. And when it comes to um, unsafe abortions, our region, it has half of all the estimated unsafe abortions globally. And this is again a big fault line. Um, and then uh, the pandemic actually has, we have said that, you know, there is a reversal of, uh, uh, reversal of many of the indicators. And when it comes to harmful practices, the pandemic, the estimate is that, that the pandemic can potentially result in 13 million additional child marriages taking place globally. And, um, um, and then we know patriarchy, we know sun preference is very much prevalent and it exists um, in our region. Next slide. Further touching upon, um, uh, so one of the drivers uh, of high rates of teenage pregnancies uh, in South Asia is also because of early marriage. And early marriage is also an indication that happens in our countries, uh, especially Bangladesh has the highest rates of child marriages. 
And, um, and as a result of child marriage, what happens is um, you have unintended pregnancies, there is high rates of adolescent fertility, and it is a vicious cycle which puts uh, girl children into the cycle of vulnerability, the cycle of um, uh, vulnerability to violence, gender-based violence, uh, and all other aspects. So, um, uh, yes, um, at least, and then we have all seen that there has been a huge a gap in access to education. And um, as of April 2021, at least 850 million students have lost um, their academic year. And um, since we are talking about sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, access to comprehensive sexuality education, uh, despite the work that is going on, is, um, is still um, abysmal. That is a lot of progress that needs to be done. Um, young key population, we are talking about marginalization here. And uh, just one data I want you to look at, and that is 27% of new HIV infections in Asia and the Pacific are among young people. And when we say young people, it's not a homogeneous group. Young gay men and other men who have sex with men, they have accounted for 52% of all new HIV infections. And around 99% of new HIV infections among young people are among young key population. And here, this is the reason why we need to not look at, uh, uh, you know, look at progress in a very siloed way and not look at progress from a very, um, uh, uh, very uh, data way. We have to look at progress from a very inter intersectional and a, um, uh, as uh, Rina has also talked about, from a very structural and systemic uh, uh, barriers aspect. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and then there is no data or very little data is available when you talk about beyond the binary. And this, we, uh, the, I mean, uh, looking at gender equality, we cannot look at just the binary of men and women. And we need to look at um, gender in its fullest spectrum and collect data around the fullest spectrum and work towards or have policies, implement policies and plans uh, towards the fullest spectrum, which is again, a huge gap. So um, yeah, this is briefly talking about the COVID-19. Um, uh, as a result of COVID-19, there has been, I've just said this, there's a reversal of progress. Many of the indicators where there was some progress that has been made, now we have just stepped back and a lot more work needs to be done, um, especially when it comes to gender-based violence, sexual and gender-based violence, maternal mortality, and, uh, um, and also uh, uh, in regards to climate action. So um, a major gap is again, lack of uh, disaggregated data. And uh, when we want to make progress around gender equality, uh, women, men, non-binary persons, we are not homogeneous groups. Our backgrounds are different. We experience uh, oppression or opportunities in different ways. And data disaggregation is something that will actually point out to uh, these uh, uh, differentials and help us make better plans around uh, policies, but also implement better plans that will leave no one behind. But again, the data when it comes to gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights is very limited. So, um, so at the end of the day, I would like to reiterate what the previous uh, speakers have said and taking stock, we can go to the next slide, and taking stock, the picture doesn't look so good. And um, although we have international commitments uh, pertaining to gender equality and uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, what we need to do now is to implement the agreed commitments uh, on gender equality and SRHR, because it's high time we keep implementing the actions in a very coordinated and an integrated manner, taking the structural and systemic barriers into account. 
these are some of Arrow's publications um, that can be available for you. Arrow does one of Arrow's key strategy is monitoring international commitments pertaining to women's health, and we monitor the SDGs. Here we have monitored the goal five on gender equality, and we have also uh, looked at uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. We can go to the next slide, and that's the close. And thank you, Sai. Thank you very much for showing the darkness around us because only that will make us strive to lead towards light. And uh, there are a few comments, although we have overshot the time, but I would like to read a few comments which we have and a few questions. There's a comment on Facebook that very good comprehensive presentation by Sai. Is there a global monitoring to ensure domestic laws and policies are in line with global commitments like CEDAW, ICPD, Beijing, uh, 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 declaration as as well. Yes, um, when I think there was a presentation this morning that was made on CEDAW, uh, and CEDAW is a mechanism which um, also, when the CEDAW committee gives recommendations to the countries, it is a legally binding document which helps uh, which our governments have to put in place and domesticate these laws and policies. So uh, definitely with regards to CEDAW implementation, we can see, we can have hope um, to bring it forward. Even the UPR, when the recommendations come, they can actually be implemented on the ground. And that's the reason why it is very important for us to stay connected at the national, regional, and at the global level. So we bring the global commitments back to the country and start domesticating and implementing. The CEDAW is a great instrument and it's a legally binding instrument and monitoring CEDAW will be a great way forward. Okay, uh, so there is another comment which says that even before COVID-19, the SDG targets were not on track, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Asia Pacific region. And, uh, I, uh, and the comment says that COVID-19 has given the governments a good excuse for poor progress. <laughs> Totally agree, totally agree with you. And um, I would not comment on that because I totally agree that there was uh, much less progress. We were never meeting the gender equality goal at any point in time. Right. And one comment says that emotional violence, which is experienced by so many women and really devastates their lives is really recognized or recorded. Um, yes, so physical violence, psychosocial violence, yes. and these are, you know, the categories of violence um, of late. Um, uh, first of all, we do not even have data on the current frameworks of violence, uh, but uh, definitely it is recognized in theory. But I have to say that in terms of collecting data, uh, I am not sure if that progress has been made. Yes, and a lot many questions on marital rape. Uh, Dr. Shamima from Pathfinder International says in Bangladesh, marital rape and intimate partner violence is not considered as violence. And then we have Mency Denimi from PNG uh, asking, is marital rape considered uh, violence in the Pacific nations like PNG or Fiji? Uh, for uh, PNG and Fiji, I will have to check. But I, as far as I know, around 36 countries um, although there is some progress that is being made, but around 36 countries in this region do not recognize marital rape. Yes. And uh, Nahid Khalid from Pakistan has a question on that, that how did countries where marital rape is a crime make that process, progress? Any lessons or learnings from them? Um, at this, um, in terms of marital rape, there has been progress in some of the countries. Um, in the last five years, I think, um, uh, I can't uh, say which country it is, but there has been a country where uh, marital rape has been recognized um, uh, as, uh, 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 as criminal action as well. Uh, but I will come back to you on that. I do not have the name of the country at this point. Okay, and then uh, there is a question uh, from, uh, rather a comment from Mahisun Rashtri. Bangladesh has faced a drastic fall in decreasing child marriages due to the pandemic. I personally have lost friends as they had to drop out from colleges. Their parents thought waiting for the world to get normal is a waste of time. And as the whole education system was off, it was better to get their daughters married. Yeah. So, 
and uh, to them marriage is the best solution to enhance their daughter's future yes and there is uh, evidence that actually shows that there has been a spike in child marriages in bangladesh um, and especially also in humanitarian crisis uh, this is uh, something like a trend that has been seen but um, uh, definitely there is evidence that shows that there is a spike in child marriages in bangladesh okay there is, there is a comment uh, maybe here some significant steps undertaken to advance gender mainstreaming particularly with sdgs and uh, objective 5.1 at the asean given that the issue of gender is taken up by various asean committees and pillars what could be learned from these steps for organizations who may want to re replicate these steps along right. with it is in the chat box right thank you thanks for that question and when we are talking about um, um addressing discriminatory uh, laws um around uh, gender um uh there are different frameworks uh, and uh, uh we do see that asean has a human rights framework again uh, and gender equality is also one of the uh, areas of work which uh, asean looks at um and un women has a database of all the different um uh, gender equality acts um or all the different uh, laws and policies that are currently in place uh, it also goes into what are the different pol programs and what is the implementation status also so uh, you, we can look at those kind of frameworks uh but uh, definitely what we see is in terms of laws and policies some of the countries in the region have made that progress even in malaysia there is some talk around um having a gender equality act in place um we do make sometimes what happens is we do make progress uh, and get these uh, laws passed in our parliaments in our countries but what when it comes to its implementation i think the gap is around the implementation mostly so um yeah so that is what we will have to see uh, here i also want to give an example about very recently i think in 2013 uh, many of our colleagues from bangladesh would know that uh, there was this child um, uh, marriage restraint act that was passed and in the law it was this when this law was passed and many groups have applauded because of course there is a law that is being passed but then it comes with a clause and the clause is uh, under special circumstances so and these are those loopholes and these gaps which then makes no meaning for having any progressive laws and policies because at the end of the day within these uh, specific clause we still can uh, make provisions in order to get away from uh, being progressive you 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 are very right very right sai and uh, thank you very much uh, for the inputs you have given we have overshot the time by more than half an hour but that shows how intensely the issues were spoken about and how intensely they were discussed so thank you very much and with this we come to the end of the first day of the asia pacific regional training program on gender equality and human rights i'm sure our eminent speakers have given us enough food for thought to reflect upon as to where we stand today in terms of gender justice to achieve our goal of a just social order my sincere thanks to each one of you for being with us here today and making it such a lively session we meet again tomorrow for two separate sessions one for gender justice advocates that will begin at the same time as today that is 11 am bangkok time and end at 1:30 pm bangkok time the second session for media will be held from 3 pm bangkok time to 4:30 pm bangkok time tomorrow the zoom link to join tomorrow sessions will remain the same as that for today goodbye till then stay safe namaste